two, move to be item A1 under governance issues by statute. That's the first order of business needs to be action on the director's contract. All right, do I have a second? Oh, go ahead. Um, and I'd like to pull um, the B1 and 7. All right, from consent, we have B1, ABM, and B7, HES. All right, so we have three amendments. We are moving uh, item A1 after item A2. We are also pulling items B1 and B7 uh, for conversation, or for discussion. All right. I move approval of the agenda with the stated adjustments. Do I have a second? Second. All right, all in favor, please raise your hand for the amended agenda. All right, passes. We will now move on to awards and recognitions. I see many smiling athletes, student athletes out there, their families and their coaches. So excited to hear about you. Dr. Battle. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Bugs and board members. Um, tonight, we're going to honor some excellent and I repeat, excellent. So Oliver and Samuel, teamed up to reach the tennis double state championship match in class AA, the largest tennis division in TSSAA. Oliver and Samuel have come up to the podium. Um, please uh, hang out for just a moment. We're gonna take a quick picture. On the way to the championship match and a state runner-up medal, Team Craddock slammed their East Tennessee opponents in the quarterfinals and semifinals, defe defeating both opponents eight to three. Oh, one more note. Oliver and Samuel are just freshmen, by the way. Oh, wow. I just have a feeling they'll be back in the state championship before they graduate. Congratulations to Oliver and Samuel on a great season. Um, and again, we'd like to get a quick picture before you go. Kudos to your teachers, family, your principal, Kelly Hargis in the back. Thank you for being here to support them as well. So if we can have the board member come up. You can, yep. Yes, now or later, in just a minute. We're gonna keep it moving okay. and everybody we're gonna, coming. We're gonna do one large picture in just a moment. Congratulations, let's give them a round of applause. After battle, if you can follow direct. championship, three team runner-ups, seven relays, and 15 individual state champions. We will recognize each of these champions this evening, so stay tuned for that. <laughs> this year, we also had a team qualify for the TSSAA Unified Track and Field State Championships. High School Unified Track and Field is a partnership between the TSSAA and the Special Olympics to form inclusive sports that combine students with intellectual disabilities and students without intellectual disabilities for training and competition. Whites Creek High School hosted the TSSAA Middle School, excuse me, Middle Tennessee section, sectionals and the Cobras won the 100 meters and the long jump. Finished second. <laughs> They finished second in the shot put and finished second in the team competition as well. We are so proud of the Weiss Creek Unified Track and Field team and Coach Michael Fox, thank you for all you do. Um, and we will take a picture um, um, with this group of athletes um, and congratulate them on a job well done and we will later take a larger photo with everyone else. So um, again, let's give it up for our Weiss Creek team. They're gonna step up and take a quick picture.
All right, so like I mentioned a moment ago, MPS student athletes won 15 individual state championships and seven relay state championships this spring. Three of our teams finished as state runner-up and one team brought home the gold with a state championship. So let's meet, meet the individual event champions first. And um, student athletes, I'll ask you to come up to the podium when I call your name. Um, we'll take a quick picture with you and then we're gonna have you come back up and take a large picture uh, once we recognize everyone. So first up, we're gonna begin with Marion Brown of Pearl Cone Magnet High School. <laughs> Um, thank you, Principal Harrington, for coming up to accept his award. He's unable to be here. Um, he won not one, not two, but three Class A state championships in the 100 meters, the 200 meters, and the 400 meters. Next up, we have Ariana Reed of Hillsborough High School, who won the Class AAA state championship in the 400 meters. Way to go. The pentathlon. All right. Congratulations. Not easy. He had to run fast, easy. run long, throw something, jump something, <laughs> jump, 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 throw far. Oh, goodness. Do a homework. <laughs> Congratulations, Amaya. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is Lanaya Roberts, also from Martin Luther King. the class double A state championship in the discus. Woo Congratulations. <laughs> Next up from Maplewood High School, um, our student athlete won the class double A state championship in the shot put and that student is Carolyn McRee. Strollers <laughs> representing. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Can you, can you run the world? Yes, we run the world. Literally run. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, no, and not, well, actually, we can just throw. <laughs> throw the world. We can just throw, throw and put. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you to Mark North, our secondary um, athletic director, for organizing us today, recognizing our student athletes. Uh, we also have from Martin Luther King um, a student athlete who won two state championships in class AA for the 100 meters and 200 meters, and that's Aya Lane. <laughs> the high jump, and the 100-meter hurdles. Let's give a round of applause to Anaya Marshall. And finally, we have three Pearl Cone student athletes to round out our list of individual state champions in the track and field. We have Ja'Kayla Morris, who won the long jump in class single A. <laughs> we also have Ariana Thomas, who won the 300 meter hurdles. and Terea Hawkins, who won the 200 meters.
Congratulations to all of these individual champions. We also have seven state championship relay teams to celebrate tonight. Three teams that were state runners up and one team that won the overall state championship for its class. Please come on up for a quick photo as I call your relay team. Um, the relay champions for class A, the Pearl Cone Boys four by 200 meter. The Pearl Cone Girls, four by 100 meters. The mama going to be mad later. <laughs> Thank you. We also had relay champions from class AA, um, and they are the Martin Luther King boys, four by two. <laughs> All right, the Martin Luther King boys, four by 400 meters. Come on back up. <laughs> Martin Luther King girls, four by 200 meters. It's always after graduation. And the Martin Luther King girls four by 400 meters. Yeah. <laughs> See, we also have three teams that were runners up for the entire state for their class. And we would like to recognize them at this time. Let's give it up for the East Nashville Girls Class A runner-ups. Legs for days. Jeez. Let's get the hardware in there. Congratulations, ladies. The Pearl Cone Boys, Class A runners up. Let us please come on up so we can recognize you.
Congratulations. And the MLK Girls Class AA Runner Ups. Please come on up so we can recognize you as well. Congratulations, ladies. We're so proud of you. And finally, last but not least, we have a team that won the overall state championship for its class, and that is the Pearl Cone Girls in class single A. Let's give it up for these amazing athletes. Y'all go on through and get on up hey, there. Athletes up to the podium to take a picture with uh, school board members. <laughs>
as we're transitioning, thank you all for a great season. Congratulations again, our student athletes, our parents, teachers, coaches, principals. Run. I was in high school, I was more of a long sprinter, and in uh -huh. college, I was middle distance. So 400 to yeah. like 800. Yeah. And then in college, I went kind of 4 to 15. 4 by what team? 4 to 15. Four, four to 15. Four, so 400 to a mile? Mm -mm. 400 just shy of a mile. Anybody with time for that? Yeah. All right. Um, again, congratulations to everyone. Next up, I'm very proud to honor a group of true heroes from Inglewood Elementary School. On the morning of May 11th, um, unfortunately, a man appeared on the other side of the fence next to Inglewood Elementary's playground and made it clear that he wanted to get into the building, even though no one from the school knew him. The man was acting erratically. He walked away down the street and then came back. Then he jumped the fence and sprinted to the door of the school. But these teachers and this support staff they weren't having it. They knew what their priority was, and that was the safety of their students. So the protective instincts and the drilling kicked in, and these women got moving. Please come on up to the front and call each name. with the man to keep him out, eventually tackling him. Miss Davis broke her elbow in the process and had to go to the hospital later, but she got her students in safely while keeping the man on the other side of that door. Thank you, Miss Davis. Nikki Thomas, Inglewood's secretary, who got to the playground quickly, helped usher the students inside and then helped restrain the man as he continued to struggle until Metro Police officers arrived. Miss Nikki Thomas. Principal Ashley Croft. Now, this is not the end of the story because meanwhile, Peggy Hawkins, Inglewood school-based substitute teacher and general assistant, was subbing in another kindergarten class that day and was on the playground at the time. She quickly got her class lined up and safely into the building. Thank you so much for your swift response, Ms. Peggy Hawkins. because Jenneth Brackman, the school's itinerant occupational therapist, saw Ms. Davis's class coming into the building and saw Ms. Davis struggling with the man. She didn't really know the particular, these particular students, but she took them to a nearby safe space, stayed with them, supported them, and kept them safe during a scary time. Thank you, Ms. Brackman.
Ashley Croft, um, Englewood's principal, who's already standing at the front, took charge and showed great leadership, working with her staff, Metro Police, and the team here at the support hub to resolve the situation, communicate with parents, and most importantly, she kept everyone safe. Thank you for your leadership. <laughs> Now, let me acknowledge a few things before we take a quick picture. This is not what anyone you for your courage. We are so proud of you and we're extremely lucky, lucky to have you on our team at Metro Nashville Public Schools. I also want to acknowledge that um, this team was recognized um, by um, District 7 Council Member Emily Benedict and presented with a proclamation honoring the Inglewood Elementary Heroes at the June Council meeting. So congratulations um, to you all. Thank you, Council Member Benedict, <laughs> for presenting them for, with the proclamation. We appreciate everything you do for the Wood and MMPS. Councilwoman, come up. November of 2020, Spencer Taylor, our Executive Director, Director of Nutrition Services for the District, went on leave and deployed to the Middle East as a Lieutenant Colonel with the Army Reserve's 3rd Divisional Medical Deployment Command, for which he serves as the Area's Operation Dietetic Consultant and Health Promotions Officer. Mr. Taylor, who has 34 years of combined service in the Naval Service and Army Reserve, was in the Middle East until July of 2021, but could not return to work with MEPS until December, December due to non-combat injuries he sustained while he was serving overseas. As he was completing his active duty in the Army, Mr. Taylor nominated his boss here at MNPS. And that is Executive Officer for Operations Ken Stark for the Secretary of Defense Employer Support Freedom Award. This is the highest recognition given by the U.S. government to employers for their outstanding support of employees serving in the Guard and Reserve. As Mr. Taylor put it, I nominated Ken for this award because he was most supportive of my call to service for deployment. This period was close to the height of the pandemic and the vaccine was not available at that time. Our work at that time was very fluid. It was not a perfect time for me to leave the district, not to mention my family. However, Ken made me believe he was confident in the processes our department had in place. gesture. Last week, the Army got in touch with Mr. Stark and Mr. Taylor to let them know that Mr. Stark had won the Secretary of Defense Employer Support Freedom Award, and yesterday, Mr. Stark received it from the U.S. Army Command Sergeant Major uh, Maury Curry. He's going to kill me for this. He had no idea I was doing this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Stark, where are you? Can you stand? Come on up to the front. <laughs> Thank you. 
Spencer, Ken, thank you for the example you set for how to support, in both, uh, support employees in both ordinary and extraordinary circumstances. Mr. Taylor, thank you for your service to our district and our country. We are so proud of both of you. And if you don't mind, Ken, we'd like to take a picture of you and congratulate you, congratulate you again on this special honor. Congratulations. So congratulations again to all of our excellent student athletes uh, rep representing so well in the classroom and on the court and track. Um, also, thank you to our Inglewood heroes for just stepping up. Congratulations again to all those stu those spring student athletes. Both Dr. Battle and I ran track and went to college on track scholarships. And I don't know that the board ever recognized track because it tends the state championship meet tends to happen after graduations. And so it's it's amazing that these ba I'm sorry not babies that these young people can be <laughs> celebrated. All right, Dr. Battle, director's report. All right, thank you, Chair Bugs and board members. I think tonight's director's report is timely. Um, we're all continuing to reflect on the tragic mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas that took place three weeks ago. Um, three weeks that must surely feel like much, much longer to the grieving families and community there. And we continue to think about what we're doing to keep our own students safe right here in Nashville and in Metro Nashville Public Schools. So school security, school safety and security is not the role of one person, it's not the role of one position or one department. It is a collaboration between various different stakeholders, departments and agencies who work together to prevent incidents from happening and respond when they do. Our school staff, from principals to teachers to support staff, all work together on keeping students safe, developing plans and protocols to ensure there is proper supervision during transition times, that we're working to stop conflicts before they escalate, through restorative practices and responding quickly when incidents do occur. Our MMPS security department rotates throughout the district on a daily basis in response to incidents when they occur, providing guidance and support, as well as conducting searches when necessary or answering questions from school or district administrators. Transportation also plays an important role as communication with principals about incidents can be important to diffusing future situations. The MMPD is, our MMPD is involved in our schools through the SRO program, as well as strong spirit of collaboration between our two metro agencies and the support of Chief Drake for the needs of our students. Student Support Services provides help and guidance to our schools on how to properly prevent or address safety situations seen throughout the normal course of school operations. Students and families also have a key role in keeping our schools safe, with parents reinforcing rules and expectations outlined in the Student Parent Handbook with their students and our students reporting suspicious behavior and helping to establish a culture and climate that discourages bad behavior. As a note, the Student Parent Handbook this upcoming year will also include information about the importance of gun safety and locking up guns. Uvalde was neither the first nor the worst school shooting in America. Over the last 25 years or more, there have been several school shootings where one or more gunmen have sought to hurt or kill as many people as possible. As a result, there have been several safety measures put in place with a focus on addressing both the average daily safety concerns of our school as well as preparing for the worst case scenario and ensuring our buildings are more secure from the threat of active shooters. These are just a few examples of safety and security enhancements. Our goal is to be open and transparent in a way that provides assurances to students, to staff, and families without completely broadcasting to bad actors all of our security strategies that are employed daily. 
We've been installing security vestibules throughout our district, and this has been a recurring request in the capital improvement budget. They are are in nearly all of our schools with a few left to go with that will be prioritized over the summer and into the 22-23 school year for completion. We've installed um, AI phones at our entrances to ensure that someone in the front office can hear and see who is requesting to come into their building before the door is unlocked. We've put in place badge access on exterior doors so only authorized individuals can access areas outside the main front door. Several years ago, the district made investments to ensure that all of our classroom doors can be locked from the inside with the ability to automatically lock the external door handles. On the night of the Uvalde shooting, we were in contact with Metro Nashville Police Department and Chief John Drake as what, to what next steps should be in place to ensure our last days of school were conducted without incident, while also starting to talk about additional measures that were needed to ensure safety. The next two days, the MPD sent officers to all elementary schools across the district to have discussions with principals about their needs and to reassure them that they have partners in school safety. At the launch of Promising Scholars, which kicked off um, early June, the MPD committed to increasing their presence at these locations by having SROs and other officers visit or patrol at key times. One of the strongest connections between MPS and MPD is through the School Resource Officer Program, which allows experienced police officers to volunteer for assignment in one of our MPS middle or high schools. It is important to note that these are not just armed security, but rather they are tasked to provide mentorship and instruction while helping to create a safe learning environment. They receive special training on how to do just that and are meant to build meaningful relationships with staff and students alike, in addition to providing a police response when necessary. Our current staffing agreement is one SRO per middle school and two per high school. MMPD has experienced staffing shortages just like nearly every other public or private entity, but they are committed to working to find those staff to ensure each school is covered. MMPD also works with schools to provide for security planning based on the state law and provides guidance and support to school administrators in developing those plans. We've met several times with MMPD since the Uvalde shooting to discuss our needs and what they can offer in addition to their normal layer of support. They would like to provide additional active shooter and SRO type training to selected school-based or security staff, and they are continuing conversations with our operations team on necessary necessary security enhancements that will provide an even safer school environment. We have several layers of security in addition to the previously mentioned enhancements over the years. As I mentioned before, our MPS security department rotates throughout the district on a daily basis in response to incidents when they occur, providing guidance and support as well as conducting searches when necessary or answering questions from school or district administrators. We've installed security cameras throughout our schools that can help in response to ongoing situations and providing um, investigatory evidence when necessary to identify students' responsible for behavioral incidents. We've installed Raptor systems that can allow for instant background checks of visitors to ensure they are not on registries of dangerous individuals. Our K-9 unit is used for security searches that can detect both weapons and drugs as requested by school staff. Various other security equipment such as metal detector wands, radios, dispatch equipment, and other tools to respond to incidents, as well as support and safety and emergency response protocol planning. We also have campus support positions, previously called campus supervisors, at our middle and high school level that help to provide school-based security. Again, safety and security is not only about protecting students from active shooters, but also protecting them from daily safety issues that could result in physical or emotional harm to our students. Our student support services team has worked with our schools over the last year to put in place advocacy centers in all of our elementary schools focused on helping students to process their emotions in a healthy way that will reduce behavioral incidents in the future, as well as restorative practice assistance and peace centers in our middle and high schools and identifying a mental health provider for all of our schools. 
We put protocols and teams in place to assess threats posed by students or others towards the safety and security of students or staff, along with plans for individual student safety issues and screening tools for students exhibiting signs of su suicidal ideation. We've built up our Title IX and anti-bullying supports to provide assistance with investigations, along with training and protocols to ensure that we are properly addressing threats to students and providing appropriate disciplinary responses when situations occur. Our team also works with stakeholders to develop the disciplinary matrix and guidelines that schools follow to ensure we have a progressive disciplinary response. So, we got some good news on Friday that we wanted to share with you. Uh, Mayor Cooper and Metro Finance Department are in, a very, are in very promising discussions with Metro Council Budget Chair Berkeley Allen to dedicate non-recurring non non one-time funds that will be allocated towards MPS in the next fiscal year for the purpose of safety and security investments for our schools. I think that deserves a round of applause. That's a swift response. We deeply appreciate their focus on the safety of our students as well as the school board and our operations team has identified the best possible use of those funds to strengthen the security of our facilities, which will include upgrades or additional or improved fencing, improvements to outdoor lighting, additional security cameras, complete and security vestibule projects, and more. We've been awarded a grant from the Department of Justice to support the development and implementation of a reporting system for students who anonymously share information about threats or situations that could lead to harm or violence. Currently, we have campus supervisor positions that exist in middle and high schools to provide monitoring and supervision of the campus during school hours. We are exploring the potential for funding and expanding these roles into elementary schools that will provide unarmed support that could ensure things like doors closed and locked, pressure testing, our safety and security measures, transition monitoring, and that general school safety protocols are being followed by everyone on a daily basis. We'll also be working to review our door locking and release procedures and systems with school administrators and reviewing and enhancing safety procedures, protocols, and plans with school staff as we prepare for the upcoming school year. And we'll continue our conversations with MMPD on other ways that we can improve safety without detracting from the learning and working environments in our schools. So thank you to this entire board for your conversations, for your support um, as we continue to review our our safety plans and, and, and bounce them up against best practices, which we've learned we have, and how we can continue to go deeper around ensuring the safety of everyone on our campuses. So thank you all for your leadership. And I wanted to give a quick update on TCAP testing. Um, as you may have seen, the state released their data today at the statewide level, which shows that there were positive gains in nearly all categories and that students were returning to pre-pandemic testing levels. We have been going over our own student level data and we're prohibited by the state from releasing more information until July 6th. But teachers, staff, all the leaders across Metro Nashville Public Schools, I've been very pleased with our preliminary review of the data. We have, and we think the board will be very pleased with the growth and results. We know we're on a journey to continuous improvement, but I think what we will see and what we'll be able to share really speaks to the hard work, the dedication, and the talent we have right here in Metro Nashville Public Schools. So more information to come, um, and we'll be sure to get that information to you as soon as it's available. Thank you. Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. Yeah, Thank you, Dr. Battle. That returning to pre-pandemic numbers, I, I'm excited to see, you know, like as you said, you know, we will continue to grow and continue to make change and continue to better develop this system, but thank you. Just echo, echo. All right, do we have questions from the board before we move on to public participation? Go ahead, Mrs. Elrod. Thank you. I have um, a handful of questions. Uh, my first question is, students with disabilities are arrested at um, a rate of 2.9% higher than students without disabilities inside their schools. So my question is, do our SROs receive any specific training for students with disabilities or do they receive any de-escalation training? Ideally both. 
Yes, and I would love for um, maybe Ken, Debbie, if y'all want to talk to some of the specifics. Um, we've received and we re reviewed such data as well, received feedback, and so um, I will tell you that MMPD and MMPS are stronger than ever in our collaboration around professional learning um, and responding to the needs of our students, making sure the appropriate training um, is available um, to their staff and as they support our schools here in MMPS. Um, so, Ken, Debbie, please feel free to share um, any specifics. Sorry, and I just happen to be here tonight, so <laughs> glad to Thanks, be here. Um, so we did do a training for all of our SROs at the start of the school year. We had one of our um, specialists in our department. Her name is Ada Winford. She's a specialist with students with autism, but with all students, and really talked about all the different disability areas, way to de-escalate students, um, things to look for. So it was very well received. We got great feedback from it. And also one of our um, board certified behavior analysis also did that training. And we'll continue doing those trainings as long as we're asked. We'll continue to do those. And I know we will be asked again because there was such great feedback from all the SROs. And I, I'll take this point of privilege to reiterate um, how strong our partnership is with MMPD and with our SRO program being in our schools. They are always willing to come around the table, receive the feedback, the training that's necessary um, in collaboration and partnership. So I think that's something that we're really proud of, um, that our partnership exists in that state uh, where we're really focused on kids, doing what's best for them and being really clear about the role of SROs. Anything else? Yeah. I, would, I would like to add that the other piece that was important from the MNPD perspective was that they deal with um, people with uh, various disabilities uh, outside of school as well. So all of that training that we provided them for the SROs also is applicable to the larger community as a whole. So yeah. there's a, a much broader benefit than just ours. Thank you. I think like a, a lot of um, trainings and additional work that you put into students with disabilities or stu students with learning di uh, differences, um, that always is good for the majority of the students. And it is probably just a best practice in general. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, another question I have is I have been asked mo more recently, probably because of the recent um, experiences, if we're going to require clear backpacks, which is a why or why not, and um, of course they would like to know about ongoing concerns and wants for metal detectors. Yes, I'll be um, happy to respond uh, more. Please feel free to approach the podium and address um, any concerns in this area. I, I think as we're talking about the safety and security um, of our students and our staff and just our learning communities um, in general, it's important that we, yes, implement best practices, but we do everything that we can to maintain a welcoming, enriching um, learning environment for our students and for everyone else. And so that's always going to be important. These are conversations we have with MMPD as well to make sure we have the best practices um, in place. With regards to clear backpacks, um, there are some privacy concerns. There's been some uh, recent research about the ineffectiveness of clear backpacks as well um, for students. And so we're digging into that. Listen, I, I'll be clear. We've put everything out on the table because we take this very seriously. This is a priority. It was a priority for this board even as we navigated um, the pandemic. And that's not going to change now. Um, but um, there are some trade-offs when it comes to some of the things that may be recommended, which I understand. Um, we have definitely explored uh, many angles um, for which we can increase and enhance the safety and security um, in our buildings. And going back to the metal detectors, that takes an awful lot of uh, manpower. The metal detectors alone don't solve the problem um, itself. And again, we're trying to disrupt uh, pipelines um, for our students. And so uh, to your point, um, and to maybe those who are asking that question, we've got to take a really good balance around both those pre pro proactive measures, but also the responses um, that we have. And there is no greater resource than our people um, when it comes to making sure students are safe and pressure testing those measures um, on a daily basis. So I understand the question. We have looked at every angle and will continue to bounce those strategies and what we decide to invest in and implement um, against best practices. One thing that has been 
been very clear to us as we reviewed our process again, this is an annual, daily, weekly process for us, um, is that we have a lot of the best practices right here in Metro Nashville Public Schools. I've gotten lots of comments that we're kind of top notch when it comes to that, but we want to make sure that the training for our people um, is where it needs to be. We have any updates that we need to and that we're implementing with the high level of int integrity with regards to those security measures. Um, but of course, we have fabulous Mara Sullivan, who is our Chief of Operations, and I'll just yield to see if there's anything else you'd like to add. Um, thank you, Dr. Battle. That's that's very kind. But you covered the the gamut of things very very well. I appreciate that. Um, I to the point that you made of our having best practices in place now. I had a a meeting, just a regular uh, weekly meeting with uh, the new deputy chief um, in within M. MNPD, um, and we were just talking about our different best practices around our security measures, and uh, he has a um, his team now doing security outside drive-by security assessments of our schools, and that will be complete by the end of this month, and he's um, just been really, so far, very impressed with the work. Um, it, he is not new to MNPD, but he is new to working with us and he's been incredibly impressed by the work that, that he has seen so far and, the, and um, all of our, um, the way that our schools present under the security assessment. So um, that's going to be a, a great addition to, uh, to our cadre of information that will help us with uh, the money that we're, thankfully, uh, additional dollars that uh, we're going to receive to improve our enhancements. So. Yeah, and I think I'll be remiss if I did not also acknowledge the um, safety measures that are in place, the multiple safety measures that are in place upon entry um, as well, which we've gotten kind of kudos around um, of best practice. So from the security vestibules that we're almost um, finished completing to our A1 phones, to our Raptor system and buzzing into the um, school. And so... We, we do have lots of um, um, measures um, at the point of entry um, as well, and we'll continue to train our team around um, what that should look like, standardizing our practices so that when visitors do arrive on our campus, they, they know what to expect um, with regards to entry into our learning environments. But to that oh, so sorry. Uh, to that point of making sure that our classrooms are still um, primarily learning environments that are welcoming and encouraging where safe learning can take place. Um, you know, I, the, I think the biggest indicator of our student safety is the mental health resources that we have and social emotional learning resources that we have. Um, and so I, I encourage us as a board to continue to prioritize those, particularly for um, the policy that we put in place, I think it was 2019, um, I, for a, we had the and no expulsions for our elementary age students. And we need to continue to prioritize that so we can um, not only help our SROs, which do an important work, and I know particularly at Overton, they were exceptionally helpful this year when we had an incident. And, uh, but the majority of that work is typically done by those already in our classroom, whether it's our teachers or counselors. Um, and so I appreciate that they're receiving that training. Um, I do want to, since we have this additional um, funds to be used on safety, I just ask that if we have any um, increase of security presence inside of our schools, that they continue to receive that training, whether it's on students with disabilities students with different learning abilities, um, and that they have the de-escalation training, that that continues to be prioritized, and um, particularly as we continue to hire, that once a year may not be enough um, if we're going to be expanding that group, and that uh, their priority is not in behavior in any way, um, and that they're not used as a behavior management, but that they're used as security. Thank you. Mrs. Masters? Sure. Yeah, I just want to ask, when you talk about the AI technology and cameras, are, are we talking about these visual mobile scanners that we purchased um, under the Meharry contract about doing the upgrades to use those for the... Um, active shooter scanning? No, the AI um, um, system is um, typically when you approach a school, um, the button you have to push with the camera to show us who's um, um, visual, vis visually 
visibly present um, and are able to communicate um, over the system to make sure we know who is actually entering the building. That is the most proactive measure um, to make sure that upon entry we know exactly who is entering the building. There is a um, visual presence where you can, there's a camera there where you can see who that individual is as well. Do we have any plans to use that those devices, um, you know, to, to do the upgrades to those devices in order to use them for that purpose? So not at this time. As I mentioned, responded to Ms. Um, Elrod, um, we have, we're looking at everything to make sure that, again, we have best practice, we have the most proactive um, systems in place. Um, what we've been using those for have been on the health component right. um, of things as well, and I, we, we have to be very mindful about those. Um, um, measures that are proactive measures um, and that require manning um, as opposed to the proactive and as uh, Maura mentioned, the kind of the external to internal measures that need to be in place. But we are definitely exploring um, everything. Um, not at this time are we looking to, to do that, but as we move forward, nothing's off the table based upon making sure that we have the best practices represented in Metro National Public Schools. Do we have any idea what the cost would be for the for those upgrades in order to use them for that purpose? I think we have a general idea. Ken, if you just give me a head shake. Yeah, we have somewhat of, of an idea. We have had conversations about that, but again, we also have to bounce that up against the what's best practice mm -hmm. um, for our students and for our staff inside the schools. And again, we're also working with MPD around some of those best practices as well. They have been very helpful around helping us think through those strategies, what's considered proactive, what's considered responsive, um, and building that plan um, as we move into the that's been um, something I've been asking for and really passionate about as it not only protects students, of course, in uh, school shootings, but the goal is, of course, to also prevent suicides and um, accidental shootings, which are the leading one, leading cause of death for students and children, unfortunately, right now in the United States. So I really appreciate that. We, um, I believe, are going to be the first in the state. So we are... Um, we're sometimes a little too humble, and we are the best in the state in lots of ways. And uh, I would just encourage the state to provide this as well, because it's a low-cost, no-cost notification that would save lives and would be so helpful to not only school shootings, but just the gun issue in general. So I really appreciate that. Absolutely. And the Student Parent Handbook will be before this board um, this summer for approval and implementation for the 22-23 school year. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bush, and then Mrs. Poopa Walker. Yes, Miss <clears throat> um, Masters had hit on some of the things I was going to speak about, about those um, thermal cameras. And I know that I have an opportunity, I had the opportunity to personally look at the thermal camera. And it's not just thermal, that was one of the things that when we purchased the, um, the thermal machines, it was for the health component, of course, taking the temperatures, but it also is a security uh, monitor, like not say a uh, metal detector, but it's more sophisticated. And I had opportunity to spend a little time with the um, the owner and the developer, and it was really really cool system where it was not intimidating. Like you had said, you wanted to make sure that it's still a, a friendly uh, learning environment, an environment for our students. And yes, uh, metal detectors do work; they do keep out guns out the schools. And I'm just curious, um, where are those cameras, and why haven't we taken a more of a deep dive looking at those cameras because they're not intimidating? So I got a chance to really look at it and be able to go through the whole step process. And actually, it's really a system where a student has a badge, just like they have badges now, and they scan as they come in, and they come in and scan. looking at this as an option because I have been to my own son's high school and as we build in high schools, middle schools, they're becoming more of a campus. So there, there's so many multiple doors that students are going in and out of. And so this will be a great opportunity to be able to man that and be able to um, um, secure um, our buildings a, a lot more when it comes to guns.
guns, knives, that kind of thing. So I'm just kind of curious about why we're not using them. We spent $1.9 million on them. They're not just used for thermal, they're used for security. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get some feedback. And where are they? Yeah, they can be used for, for that, um, to, to my understanding. So um, those cameras are still in our schools. Um, when we made um, the shift to having a nurse in every school and they were monitoring particularly our COVID protocols, now it's just about all things um, health for our students. Um, the majority of them are used through our nursing um, process. Some of them, all, some of our schools also use them at the front when students are not feeling ill. Um, you know, COVID was one thing, but we've always had illness in schools, and so it definitely helps uh, with regards to that safety um, for our students. I think there are lots of, <coughs> excuse me, operational concerns when you're talking about scanning one student at a time when hundreds of kids um, are coming in and the threat that that also uh, presents. There is um, uh, some cost effectiveness concerns as well. Um, so lots of operational concerns that our team has been digging into to see if it would be appropriate and a best practice for us um, to implement. As I mentioned earlier, um, our team has definitely looked to see if there's an investment um, that we need to advocate for and if it would be A lot of the best practices already in place. <coughs> so as we're continuing to move forward and dig into those best practices, everything is, is on the table because we do want to make sure we have the best. Um, as of now, the plans we have is what's represented um, here. Um, but I think we're in very, still very early conversations and learning more about um, the thermal cameras. To date, um, we've not made a decision that that is a best practice that we need to move forward with. So um, thank you for the information. I, I think if the board was to be able to look at this thermal, like a thermal presentation, because I think it would make more sense to see exactly how, exactly how it works um, because it's not intimidating, of course. It's, it's something that uh, we already have, and it's just about giving those upgrades. And I think with this mayor's proposal as far as um, security funds, I think that's something that we can really look at um, since we already have the cameras. So I know you say it's not off the table. But that's something I would like to see happen as far as those extra measures because the measures that are put in place they're good measures, but we still have work to do to make sure that the guns and knives, the metal stays at the schools. So I want to go also, I want to kind of um, touch on the elementary. Of course, the elementary schools are the ones that have been more targeted as far as how the intruders get into our schools and that we don't have SROs and we don't have security in our schools. And just, and just like we just saw a group of amazing faculty come up and basically save our students, but they had no security there. So how, how intentional are we when it comes to the elementary? I see that you said that we're exploring um, support positions, but where are we are as far as trying to get the elementary schools the support they need for the next school year? Yeah, I think we saw some very specific elementary um, components um, in here. It is, uh, and I'm, I'm going to put on my K-12 teacher principal hat, it is important that we maintain our learning spaces as learning spaces for our students. We also know, and we cannot ignore, um, some of the research and data that's out there about the presence of armed um, officers in schools. We are out those security vestibules, making sure the cameras are there so those basic security measures um, are in place. But there is a cost associated with it. And I also will acknowledge that when it comes to our SRO program, that is managed through MMPD. That is not an MMPS managed um, support that's in, um, in our budget or under um, my kind of supervision but we do work collaboratively together. So um, as you mentioned in here, um, part of our next steps is exploring. Right now we require campus support um, in 
middle school, one in middle school, we require two in high school. There is a little bit of wiggle room based upon the size of the school of what that actually looks like. So we're exploring that level of support for our elementary schools as well. Someone who knows the building, knows the kids, can do security checks, pressure tests um, to make sure that the measures we have in place are actually working. And so um, that is an additional layer of support that's currently not present at our elementary schools, that is present at our middle and high that we're looking to explore. We want to explore costs. We want to explore the ability to hire um, for these roles. And let's be honest, that's a challenge, challenge not in education, but all across every industry. Uh, we want to make sure that they're properly trained as we continue to kind of beef up, if you will, our safety and security measures. Um, and so, again, I think this is a very kind of thin line to, to go down to make sure that uh, that balance of a welcoming school safe environment is present for our students without taking all the extreme measures that um, may be suggested or recommended at a time. But we are taking action around what's happening at our elementary schools. Um, in fact, for our promising scholars like summer, Definitely worth the conversation as we reflected on um, the last incident to make sure that school um, responses take priority as we move forward. And they, they welcome that with um, much positivity and urgency um, as well. So we're, we're looking at multiple ways to attack and approach what's happening um, in our elementary schools, but I would be remiss if I didn't say this. <coughs> <clears throat> this school violence and mass shooting is not a school problem. It is not a school problem. Our kids come to school to learn. Our teachers come to school to teach. I think we would all agree. Our support staff come to support our kids. And so it would be unfair to them to respond to this if, is, if it is a school issue. This is a issue, an issue that we need to address as not only a city, a state, but as a country. Mm -hmm. And until we have some of that um, happening and that coordination, unfortunately these conversations are gonna continue to happen, but we're gonna do everything we can to get those best practices represented in our schools. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And. Um, one of the things that we don't want, we've been very blessed here in Nashville that we don't, we haven't, we haven't had that, but we have to really still think and be really, really intentional about our elementary schools, just as we do with our middle school and our high schools. And I'm hoping that during this budget that the mayor is proposing as far as the security, that that's something that's embedded, that's going to be a high priority for our elementary schools. because this is where we see more of our students um, die is in our elementary schools because of uh, people that intrude in our schools and we have teachers that try to fight them off. So we definitely got to be more intentional as far as security and, and that is a high priority. Absolutely. Well, we're definitely moving with a sense of urgency. As I've mentioned, we've met with MMPD multiple times. We've met internally multiple times. We'll continue to do that to plan accordingly. Um, these are our, our precious assets, our babies. Most of us have kids that or will be in MMPS. Uh, this is vitally important. And again, I continue to put on my teacher and principal hat. Um, I understand operationally how it works. And so we will continue to work with our school teams to make sure they have what they need. Um, that was something I shared with our principals just the other day. If you need something, you let us know um, because we want to make sure um, that you have what you need to keep your students and your staff safe. And we'll be reviewing our protocols um, over the summer with our teams to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, we will be making some adjustments to some protocols as well, and, and rightly so. And I think they'll be well received from our school teams. We're still in the process of, of getting some of their feedback, but elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, they're joyful places, um, but we also have to be guarded with regards to protecting everyone. So thank you for your feedback. Yeah, thank, you for your, thank you for that. I, that's all my questions. All right, this is Poopa Walker, then Dr. Gentry, and then Mr. Little.
I do have a question about um, how we, you know, because it's always been an interesting kind of thing to try to conduct background checks on who's coming into buildings. I know we can do some tutoring virtually, but really the in-person uh, is the best. So are we still using pencil to do background checks for volunteers? Because the last time I looked, it's a one-time check, uh, and that could have been done 10 years ago on a volunteer. Um, I'm just curious where we are on, on background checks for volunteers. Yeah, we're, we're happy to respond. Um, I've got several team members who can respond to this. Um, Carrie, you want to talk specifically around tutors. Uh, we are still working with pencil, but we also have a Raptor system um, in all of our schools as well. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, for tutoring, I can speak to uh, tutors have to have an annual background check. So they, uh, um, we've had some tutors who had to go through it again this year that tutored for us last spring, for example. Okay, great. In addition to that, we also have the registry checks as well. I also want to just say, I want to thank Dr. Battle for um, investing ESSER dollars and our dollars on advocacy centers, on additional social emotional supports, on training, um, on youth court. Um, to me, I mean, I recognize that we have to have safe buildings and cameras and all the things. But it's really about the community you build in a school. And I know from working in a high school, the tips that come about p potential danger come from students if they trust adults, if they trust leaders in their buildings. That is really where it matters the most. Um, and so I appreciate that we're bringing in staff and systems and supports to create more of that trust. Um, I also want to say I'm have built great relationships with kids, uh, but when you have armed police officers around small children, I, I, I just don't believe that that's the solution. I, I, and I will, uh, I mean, I will bring the research on that. There's just not evidence that that can happen, um, that they can be the support that we need for students. I think we can have other ways to protect students without having more guns in our buildings. So. Thank you, Mrs. Poopa Walker. Dr. Gentry. Um, so just a little bit of echo. Um, first of all, Dr. Battle, thank you for, for this. And I know we've kind of hit you with a lot of what ifs and why nots and when will you and are you gonna. But I think we just need to um, acknowledge that a lot of work has been done, that conversations are taking place. And I would just encourage board members to really not expect the answers tonight. Um, the work is still going on. And to email those suggestions or things that you'd like to see as a part of you know, advancing and expanding the security plans within our buildings. Um, but as um, Ms. Poopa Walker has said and Dr. Battle has said as well, that we have to understand that there's always going to be trade-offs. There's only X number of dollars that are available. There's so many priorities with regards to getting the academic Comes that we want, and now we've got this additional factor of boosting security. So it, it, we, we tend to have, and I say this often, we tend to have very myopic conversations about whatever the topic of the moment is, and everything else seems to fall by the wayside. And then of a sudden, what I want to see in a plan and what I want to see implemented becomes the thing that we expect the district to focus on. But there's still nine million other things that are happening in our buildings every day that need to be funded, monitored, implemented to the highest uh, um, level possible that all contribute to the outcomes. So again, this is no different than the budget discussions we have when we're asked to prioritize what it is we want because usually we don't get everything that we need. We get a lot and we've, been get, we've gotten a lot with under Dr. Battle's leadership and the great relationship she's created with the mayor's office. We've been able to get additional funding year over year since she sat in this seat, but it's never Never the totality to get everything we want at 100% level and at 100% of the efficacy that we hope to see. So let's just be mindful that there are going to be
particular school year when we're not in a pandemic, we've got X number of schools and X number of classrooms, and we create a standard learning environment for our students. During COVID, let's just call it 88,000 learning environments. Everybody's home was a classroom. So what we've been able to do under Dr. Bell's leadership and with her staff and the commitment of teachers and, and building level personnel and cafeteria workers and bus drivers that were delivering meals, meals and delivering laptops, we've been able to overcome that impact of 88,000 disparate learning environments and gotten students back to baseline. So no, we haven't knocked the scores out of the roof, but the fact that we got back to baseline pre-pandemic is major. So let us not gloss over that and let us not underestimate what it took to get us there. Thank you, Dr. Gentry. Mr. Little. Um, and thank you for that, Dr. Gentry. Uh, and I know one parent is going to speak about it tonight, but how would, and maybe you've already said, but how would parents be able to, like, report a security breach? I know it's one parent that's here tonight, and you have so many doors, so many opportunities. If you ever did after-school programming, you know how some doors open. How that be the principal, the classroom teacher, um, an adult um, in the building so that we can respond uh, uh, accordingly. Any de delay doesn't help, um, so an immediate response is needed, and our team will respond promptly. Um, and so we're going to be beefing up um, our assessments and kind of our uh, walkthroughs, if you will, to make sure that we consistently um, have that. And my team will tell you if I walk through any of our facilities and I see a door propped open, I'm the first one to kick the rock out of the door and to figure out why there was a rock in the door. Um, so we will respond promptly and I will encourage and we'll continue to communicate this, particularly as we're moving back into the school year, um, to, to do just that, um, get that response directly to that school team. Um, if for any reason there is not a response, and of course our executive directors, our family information center, we want to know um, that information so that we can respond accordingly. I mean, I, I think I'll remind everyone, we are talking about young people, um, we're, we're talking about about, you know, moving swiftly throughout the day. We want to minimize um, any of those opportunities, but on occasion, if there is something, we want to respond and make sure that our buildings and our learning environments are secure. Okay, and, and another one, as I think about the, the technology, and I saw the Fox 17 report, and as we have it sitting, have we had Do we want to put it on the market right now when there's a lot of there's a lot of school districts who would maybe love to look at it and think about purchasing purchasing the products from us? Well, well let me be clear: the the uh, thermal units we currently have are being used for health purposes. They were not purchased intended for what we're talking about today, and in fact, that would require um, significant investment from our, from our end to have the components and the software to, to make them also work in, in that way. So they are not outfitted right now to do what has been described um, that will take, um, again, significant investment. But the, the in, what, what they were purchased for, the intention that they were purchased for initially is how they're being used um, now, um, as well as in our Promising Scholars. Like this is, you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, leveraging those resources, not only during the school year, but also during our Promising Scholar sites, our nurses and staff have access to those thermal units. Okay. And, and then the last question, and, and thank you, Dr. Gents, for bringing this forward. As we think about TCAP, and I read the, the state report of how we have grown, as board members, will we have the opportunity to see kind of the high-level data of how we've done as a district broken down, maybe by high school, by high school, I mean by middle school and elementary, but also by race, so we can see or have a good idea on how it's going to come when it's fully released in July. I mean, in similar fashion to how we have um, uh, communicated out MAP scores, um, CT scores.
All right, uh, Mrs. Player Peters and then Mrs. Tyler. Um, I just want to put a comment out there in regards to security that when we work with uh, Metro government and Metro PD that we're also being forward thinking and that we're not um, falling into plan obsolescence when it comes to security and technology. One of the biggest threats to security, not in schools, but in communities, it's not also metal, but it's also plastic and 3D printers and the access that people have to literally print 3D um, plastic weapons and that when we start investing, that we're forward thinking of doing a, as much of the state of the art equipment we can with the limited resources that we have, that we're being thoughtful, that we're being ahead of um, the malice that is out there. I hate to think that way, but coming from a governance standpoint and a system standpoint, that we, as we work with MMPD, we work with the mayor's office, that we're thoughtful of what the cunningness of, of, of the malice that's out there, and that we're not being reactive, but we're being proactive. And when it comes to um, security on any level of government and any level of our community, that we have to be innovative of how we think and approach about it, because um, we just have bad actors that think in ways that we are not customer thinking because it's not our natural mindset or it's not our natural culture. And so, um, and as the community have asked us in the past, I know um, through various community groups of being very mindful of how we approach security and discipline, that we also keep that in mind that we're being held accountable. And then back to the, to the scores, um, I think when Ms. Alvarez said we have to stop being so humble <laughs> earlier, I think this is something we also remember we have to build on from earlier this year when we talked about the progress that we made in the math scores, and this is building in the, continu in the continuum of this, that it's been a year, like this time last year, <laughs> we were figuring out how do we open schools fully and thoroughly and open completely, and within a year that we are getting back to pre-pandemic and resetting the, the foundation, I think it's something that we have to promote and bring about that. Is it the end result? Absolutely not. But the fact that given everything that's happened through the pandemic, people's mental state, people's burnout, people's emotional exhaustion, kids' emotional exhaustion, teachers' emotional exhaustion, parents' emotional exhaustion, and the fact that we were able to recover to a base level within 12 months, I think has to be And how do you make up for that time? And so I just want to give kudos to teachers and to the staff and to the team because it was a multi-level doing strategy and doing implement and implementing the strategy and doing it in real time and dealing in real conditions that were not always ideal that it had to be, that it was done in spite of. And so I just really want to emphasize that for the community that this is not easy. I mean, people are still trying to recoup financially and companies are still trying to recover. And the fact that we're doing it in a system that's this big, I just have to really just say thank you, not only to you, but also to your team, because you didn't do it by yourself. Thank you. Mrs. Tyler. Um, so I am the, the Teaching and Learning Committee chair, and I had you know, asked in the past if we could go over our data once we got it in June, and it seems like now that we're going to have it in July, I'd like to go ahead and ask if we can have a Teaching and Learning Committee meeting on July 12th before our board meeting, where you guys can go over all that, and we can see all of the gains that you've spoken about, and we can ask any questions from there um, as far as how we want to see the data disaggregated or... Um, presented. That's something that I think is important for us to be able to know and to see it. So, um, and again, I also want to thank Dr. Battle and her team and especially the people who are in the trenches doing it, our teachers. So this would not have happened without you. And I know in particular this year has been the most difficult, even taking into account the pandemic year when we had to do everything virtually. Um, I have heard repeatedly from people all over, different grade levels, different clusters, this year has been the most difficult year. So um, I know it doesn't make it easier to know that there has been some success 
come from it, but to recognize that you put in the work and the time and the effort and that we appreciate that and that um, these scores are great, but we would have appreciated you even if they hadn't been because y'all are really, you just, thank you to our teachers, so. Thank you, and Dr. Severe, Ms. Bobo, if you don't mind making note of that. Um, all right, I believe we are now on to public participation. Yes, so the board will now hear from those persons who have requested to appear at this board meeting. In the interest of time, speakers are requested to limit remarks to three minutes or less. At the three minute mark uh, on the walls around you, you will hear the sound. Barbara Holt, <laughs> Dustin Muhammad, Is this last one that's <laughs> Brad Martin, <laughs> John Hagman. We got a six, we got a six, we got a six right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, board, and Dr. Battle. The, uh, this is my soon-to-be sixth grader at Kip Elementary, or, or Kip uh, Prep Middle School, College Prep. And we're here simply today to ask why, on such short notice, with such little accountability, Metro Schools, Dr. Battle, you decided to end the, their, her ability to play volleyball for the first time. The, um, we received notice a week or so before school that this is done. This is after we already signed up. Schools have set up volleyball camps, getting the kids ready. And I find it uh, very ironic that the, my topic today follows the amazing representation that we had earlier today of the young athletes the state and the city has and how they represent the city. I understand the um, charter schools get 230 plus million dollars of the budget based on this, the school size. But to simply say, oh, in a couple of months you guys set up your entire league on your own. Oh, here, we'll have a meeting with you and tell you how to do it. Seems a bit small and it seems a bit petty Metro Charter Schools is listed as an amazing bright star pretty much on Metro Nashville Public Schools website. <coughs> I wanna know where it is that that bright star faded when it comes to the middle schools and participation in sports. Why could this not be phased in? It's understandable. You have your, your budget, your resources, they have theirs. Why does it have to just be an absolute cut off and removal from this process as opposed to something that's phased in and allowed them the opportunity to move forward? I wish KIPP, which is where we go, was here as well to answer why they haven't come up with something. Why, weren't, why were they not forward thinking enough with the ongoing um, animosity, it seems, on the public side and the parent side between Metro Public Schools and the charter system as to why they didn't come up with something on their own. Why hasn't the school board reacted in a way that would say, stop, we, we need to back up here and make sure that everybody has the ability to participate in sports this year, even though we might be moving a new direction as soon as possible, as soon as everything is over, the plans are in place. Not, I'm taking my ball and going home. Here's a copy of the rules if you want to do it yourself. Thank you. Kelly Phillips. Jeannie Hunter. Hello, I'm Jeannie Hunter. I think I'm supposed to say my address. 
No, okay. Well, I live in Madison. I have a daughter at Meg's. Um, I'm happy to be here. I, should I take this off? Um, I'm here representing the Society of St. Andrew. Uh, SOSA, we often call it, is an organization that reduces food waste and feeds hungry people, um, keeping food from going to waste by donating it to existing feeding agencies. Um, food waste contributes very much to um, global warming, to climate change, and I don't want to get into all the science around that. Um, at the same time, um, 16 to 17 percent of families face food insecurity in Davidson County, and that was before pandemic, so numbers are very different, but it's 20 percent of children with, or houses with children um, face food insecurity, so that's one in five of our kids. Um, You'll hear more um, from Karen and Todd in a little bit, but um, some of our schools did a study, a food waste audit, to see how much food was going to waste in cafeterias. Um, and Society of St. Andrew was able to come and participate in that. What they did was set up share tables so that kids who were done with some kind of, with, with their food, who weren't gonna eat a thing, and it was always something, you know, still in its package or still whole or whatever. It wasn't like, you know, a half-eaten apple or something like that, but unopened milk cartons or bag of chips that they haven't eaten or whatever it is, um, they could put it on the share table and either other kids could pick it up to eat during lunch because they wanted more, because they're hungry, because they're growing, or they could take it home with them if they needed to because they weren't sure if they were gonna have dinner that night. Um, and so we worked with two schools, an elementary school and a middle school, um, and the elementary school yielded um, 1,638 pounds of food over less than a school year. Uh, we got cut off, of course, because of COVID and you know school was out. Um, but that was less than a school year. It wasn't even every single week, but um, that's a lot of food that was kept out of landfills. Um, the middle school, we went to pick up a few times, but middle school kids, when they put the food on the share table, it got eaten, so, because um, they do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, reducing food waste is a really easy, way um, to contribute to sustainability um, at the school level, and it also helps our kids um, who are hungry. Thank you. Karen McIntyre. You don't know it, but Jeannie Hunter is a, a hero in my book. Um, <laughs> if I were gonna title my talk tonight, I guess I'd call it, Are You As Smart As A Fourth Grader? About five or six years ago, uh, the fourth grade Encore kids were doing a presentation, each one had a piece of it, about climate crisis and the other environmental crises. And the poor kid, we were in the library and doing the research together, the poor kid who got stuck with food insecurity and waste was really depressed. Not exactly an exciting topic if you're a kid, right? Fossil fuel's much better. But anyway, all of a sudden he got excited and animated and called me over to his screen and pointed as if I should see exactly what he saw, which I didn't. And he said, look, look, in America we waste 40% of the food before it even gets to the table. And, and I said, yeah, I know it's bad. He said, yeah, but look over here. And he was pointing to the food insecurity piece. He said, all we need to do is take this food and give it to those people. <laughs> I said, you're brilliant, that's right. He said, I think that's gonna be my slide. I said, I think it's a good slide. He said, how much do we waste here? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so before we did the big food audit, we did a little one in 2017. It wasn't very accurate because it was just me and the kids. But at the end of the week, the whole stage was just covered with the kind of food that Jeannie was talking about. Cartons of milk, crackers, PB&J sandwiches. And he looked at that and he said, why can't we give that to the homeless people in Nashville? I said, I don't know. <laughs> So I called another hero from tonight, who was Spencer Taylor, and I said, can we do that? He said, yeah. He sent us the directions on share tables. He helped me uh, base up to the fact that we wouldn't be sued, and, and we got started. The kids organized it. In two and a half years, 
and that was before I got involved with Jeannie. In two and a half years, we transferred 10,000 pounds of food to the mission downtown, keeping it out of the landfill. And we reduced our carbon footprint by 1,252 pounds, and we rescued the equivalent of 6,411 meals. Didn't cost the district a penny. Home Depot gave us the refrigerator. And after two years of me taking it down, Jeannie came by and picked it up. I didn't have to do anything. The kids organized it. They brought the food in, put it in the refrigerator. It was a win-win. So the question would be, why don't we do this? And the question he asked at the end was, why doesn't everybody do this? And indeed, why don't we all do it? We can. We must. You're going to hear other sustainability speakers in a minute. Thank, Thank you. you. Marthea Sides. Karen Almeida. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Karen Almeida. I am a parent at Two Rivers Middle School to a now seventh grader this fall. I am speaking on behalf of our children, fellow parents who couldn't be here today, teachers and staff. My son has shared so many occasions of disrespect from classmates who do not care about the people they hurt and attack on school premises and don't hold back on the teachers you employ. A child who put his hand on my son without provocation has been constantly written up Many like him have made it their goal to continue their behavior for the lack of any consequences. Being thrown spitballs, slapped on the head in the halls, belittled, undermined among your peers. Thrown water in chairs over the bathroom stalls, subjected to fights on regular is not okay. Teachers have had to put up with these attacks so much that they no longer write them up because nothing is ever done about it. They have become buffers and referees when they should be teaching. They are expected to meet requirements, yet are failed to be protected and supported and given resources to help these situations end. How can administrations at Two Rivers Middle be empowered to offer restorative practices, excuse me, that actually work while sending the message to students that misbehavior will not be tolerated? None of this would have happened if Metro truly was a zero tolerant district. I was told this behavior issue is happening everywhere, not just our school. That's the excuse we are given. Just because it's happening everywhere does not mean it gets a pass. As an employer, you vow to protect not just your employees, but the students you require perfect attendance of. These victims work for Metro and are scolded when they speak up about the disruptive children who show time and time again, they don't give to sense about anyone. So many parents have pulled their children out because they are scared to go to school. And so many have stayed quiet, including teachers, for fear of retaliation. How messed up is that? We want change yesterday. Supporting the teachers means supporting the students. They go hand in hand. We had a recovery room program that ended as a teacher leading it had to take another position because of understaffing issues. We want that back, but what else do you plan to do to advocate for our teachers and students at Two Rivers Middle and create a safe environment that is conducive to learning? I look forward to working together to make a positive change in our schools. I am saddened to hear of so many of the um, options you have for, you know, discipline, but our schools just doesn't seem to get any. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa Alvarez. Chanel Kazee. Good evening. I'm here to speak on behalf of the parents of East Nashville Magnet High School Parent Teacher Student Organization. I have a daughter there who is a rising sophomore and I've had two boys graduate in the past few years from East as well. We are pleased that it was announced last week that we do have a new school leader in place and we, that will hopefully allow our students to have a great start to the year. 
So is our desire to put the past few years of dealing with some of the stressful situations at the school behind us. We hope that moving forward that the school leader process when parents are involved, may not seem or appear so convoluted or confusing. The selection process for the school leader of East did not seem to be inclusive of the parent, teacher, or student recommendations. It left all stakeholders feeling that their input was not valued. It may be necessary to look at parent engagement versus parental involvement. When we're looking at parental involvement, we're looking at a general term just saying that parents are participate in general things in their child's education, but we want to make sure that parents have more engagement and active and meaningful participation in their children's um, educational journey. Parents should have an active role in their school community as well. So the parents of East, of East High, want to ensure that our children have a guaranteed learning experience starting now. We want to ensure that there is equity in their access to clean and updated facilities, academic opportunities, and staffing to ensure that they have the guidance necessary to be college and career ready. Our children do not have two or three years left for the leadership to get it right. These are the last years of their school experience before transitioning to post-secondary opportunities. Students and teachers deserve to have leadership that will guarantee a safe school environment, focus on advanced academics, and exposure to enrichment opportunities that will allow them to make informed decisions about their future and help them develop into model citizens. This school year, we expect to see changes in place that will lead to student growth academically, socially, and emotionally. We want our students to have staff members in place They have the best interests of the students at heart and the focus on the school vision. Thank you. Thank you. Clara Hanala. Good afternoon, Dr. Battle and fellow board members. My name is Clara Hanala and it is a pleasure to get to speak with you today. I live in District 6. I am a rising senior at MLK Magnet High School. First, I would like to talk some bit about my experience with higher level courses. From elementary school to middle school, I was enrolled in a program, program called Encore, a program for gifted students. Encore was based solely on one test. I believe that a lot of my classmates not enrolled in the program had the potential to be in the program. They were creative and smart nonetheless. In a way, this put put a lot of my classmates at a disadvantage as I would be challenged to a level they had never seen. Many of my classmates were disappointed and felt that they were not smart enough. This is what needs to change in MNPS. The idea that young kids are put as a disadvantage is not okay, especially in this day and age. Although the Encore program did teach me a lot, it made me so upset to see my fellow classmates want to give up. As I progressed into high school, I challenged myself into taking advanced placement classes. At MLK High School, we are required to take at least three AP courses in order to graduate. This has motivated myself and a lot of my other peers to take even more than three AP classes. I myself has take, have taken four so far and will be taking three next year. AP classes has ta have taught me many skills such as organization, time management, critical thinking skills, and good study habits. With a content heavy class such as AP US history, it was critical to stay organized and push forward. One critical thing I had to learn was self-learning. Our class days and all of my AP courses would be spent test, testing knowledge we had already had to know. However, one thing I can say about AP courses and that they failed to teach me was creativity. This is one thing I had to figure out on my own while navigating these hard courses. The final thing I would like to talk about is how available these AP courses are. At MLK, we have over 15 courses, 15 AP courses to choose from. However, other schools within the district only have around three or four AP classes. It is understandable that a magnet school would have more resources for these AP courses, but it should not be the defining factor into how many AP courses are available at school. I believe it is critical to have this problem to be addressed to fix the gap between these disparities in education. MLK has opened a lot of opportunities for me and I am incredibly grateful to have attended such an amazing school. As a student greatly interested in medicine and health, I believe that these courses have taught me the skills I will need. I hope that other schools can have the chance to obtain the skills I have acquired from these rigorous courses. The AP courses I have taken have greatly prepared me for the years to come. Thank you and it was a pleasure to speak with all of you. Thank you. Tamala Enthrud.
Hello, I'm Tamala Insrud. Good evening. Following the Uvalde shooting, I had to speak to my six-year-old son about what to do in an active shooter situation at school. Now, it's a fine line between making sure he understands what to do, but also not to scare him and make him fearful of what could possibly happen at school. May 24th taught me that school shootings are no longer one-off situations, but are the new normal. This type of event is now a pattern, it's not a rarity. I have wept plenty over this tragedy. I am here today to ask, to plead, really to demand that since there are not enough resource officers in schools, especially elementary schools, and there's not enough money to hire Army veterans or National Guard reservists to patrol our school grounds, that two things happen immediately. How about distributing walkie-talkies to our educators so that they can communicate quickly and swiftly in an incident? And also, that every door is at least locked from the inside and not propped open. I am the parent that saw something and I said something, but I am sure if this is also happening in my son's school, it's happening other places where doors are propped open. Let's handle it. Thank you. Thank you. Franchita Howard. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Franchetta Howard, and I'm the proud mother of a rising senior at East Nashville High School. I've written countless emails to Ms. Bugs, Dr. Battle, Mr. Bellamy, and Dr. Turner regarding various issues at East and Metro as a whole, and of the emails that I've sent, at least 15 or more, only one has received a response, which was a generic email from Dr. Turner, which she basically copied and pasted to every parent that reached out about this, is this issue. My question tonight is, why has the board continually moved to ostracize the voice and input of parents? Why, why are teachers and administrators required to respond within 24 to 48 hours to parents, but months later, I still have no response to any of my emails? Why have single issues become more and more political and less about our students? The school board has lost sight of being about the business of their students and have failed to serve their teacher and parent partners. How can the teacher and, I'm sorry, how can this be repaired moving forward and parental input is actually considered and the sides are having conversations again about what is best for the students, our children's in the district as opposed to what's best for you that hold these seats? Christian. When was the last time that you visited any of the schools in your district, absent a photo opportunity, to really see what's going on or respond to parents and their concerns or advocate it truly for our children because I never see you and I surely don't receive responses to the countless emails that I've sent to you. Violence is rising within our school halls, and our test scores and graduate, graduation rates continue to decline. Most of these students are not college ready at graduation, and that falls squarely on this district. It's time to do better by and for our students. What can we do today to make the experience better for our students is the real question we need to start seeking solutions for. I'm not your enemy. I'm attempting to be an advocate for the students to make this district better for all of our students. Thank you. Todd Lawrence. Good evening, everyone. My name is Todd Lawrence, and I am here to talk about making sustainability a top priority at MNPS. Um, I'm the executive director for Urban Green Lab, which is a nonprofit based here in Nashville. We teach communities how to live sustainably. <clears throat> and um, just a little bit about me, I spent most of my career working in public health uh, and, uh, and sustainability education. I'm a Nashville native. 
Um, I also help lead the Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Committee, and my organization leads the Nashville Food Waste Initiative, the Nashville Environmental Justice Initiative, and a suite of frontline educational programs that grow systemic learning about sustainability in our classrooms, our households, and our workplaces. Urban Green Lab also just received an award from the Nashville Public uh, Education Foundation uh, for its partnership with you with MNPS for training teachers how to teach about sustainability in the classroom for the first time. To date, we've trained teachers in nearly 50% of all MNPS schools how to do that. Over time, with support from UGL board directors like Dr. Jennifer Berry and Ashford Hughes, we've teamed up with MNPS on everything from food waste audits with the World Wildlife Fund to our mobile lab. So I'm here today as a friend of MNPS and the city and other community members who care deeply about making this district sustainable. And I just want to impart three things to each of you. Number one, first, we have a clear sustainability goal in Nashville, and that is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2050. If we do that, we can avert irre irreversible damage to our ecosystems and our way of life. So to reach that goal, it's, an all, it's all hands on deck, and that includes the district. Number two, to be sustainable, we must be educational. We need to make learning how to live sustainably just a part of life in our classrooms, and also our conference rooms, in our living rooms, in our cafeterias. All of these should be little labs of exploring sustainable choices. It needs to be woven into the fabric of our curriculum and tied to academic standards. And third, let's not come in last place. Let us be the most sustainable school district in our state and in the Southeast, and a model for other cities striving to do the same. Now, on a personal note, I'll just say that uh, my wife, Kate, and I had a little girl over, uh, uh, over COVID-19. Her name is Ruth. I want her to come to MNPS schools and be proud that this school believes in sustainability, reduces food waste, and invests in the future of our citizens, including communities of color who often suffer the greatest impact from an unsustainable life lifestyle. So thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Amika Hunt. Good evening. My name is Amika Hunt, and I am a 44-year-old native of Nashville, Tennessee. I also grew up in the MNPS system. I am a 14-year former exceptional ed educator in the MNPS system. I'm a certified master life coach. I'm a published children's book author of a children's series based on autism, the head of bullying titled Artistic Annie, and I'm a published singer-songwriter of every genre. I made over 100 grand last year in multiple strings of income, yet all of the accolades that I just listed, I cannot attribute any of that success to being a product of MMMPS schools. I made it all the way through high school and did not do one term paper. So when it was time for me to go to college, it was very difficult for me to be able to do what was required of me. I remember coming up thinking that my parents were dumb because they couldn't help me with my homework, and it wasn't until not being an educator, but becoming a part of Nashville Propel, that I understood that it wasn't that my parents were dumb, it was a generational disservice to our children that had been happening generations and generations long before I even stepped into a grade school. And then at 26, I had my son, who has a letter from Barack Obama on the wall for academics and was accepted into middle college high, freshman year of high school. He didn't want to go, he wanted to go to McGavick with his friends, so I allowed that, but not without an uphill battle. My son developed COVID and ended up having to go to summer school. He did the work and got the grades. Came back, McGavick lost my child's grades. They make him take three classes that he has already taken over again, which eventually drops his grade point average down to a 1.75. A child with a letter from the president on the wall. Now, who's looking at him for college? And the only thing that McGavick can say is, I'm 
sorry and speaking to administration, Dr. Bailey is like speaking to a brick wall. No concern or empathy for the student or the parent at all. Never return any of my emails or calls. So I would like to say if you all have millions of dollars of literacy, please make me understand why schools like Tom Joyner, I mean Tom Joy Elementary or Jerry Baxter or Maplewood are in the bottom 5% or why Matt Gavick is at 24% in literacy. So I leave you with a poem that I wrote that goes like this. Dear MNPS, I write this in distress. We send our kids to you, but them you just neglect. Could you explain your scores? Us parents need more. Tell us how you sleep with the records that you keep. Or are you praying on us, hoping that we stay sheep? But we are wide awake. Nashville Propel is about to shake and wake up all the masses. We're no puppets with no masters. We're the parents in this fight. We advocate because it's right. Our kids are why we do what we do. MNPS, we coming for you. Thank you. Elizabeth Hines. Wendy Foster. And Cover. Good evening, Chairperson Bugs, member of members of the board and citizens. Um, my name is Reverend Ann Cover. I am I'm a parent, I'm a pastor, and I'm a retired pediatric nurse. I'm here tonight as a part of a grassroots group. We are parents, educators, and community members who are deeply um, care deeply about schools and a sustainable future for our children. It's a future where our own needs are met without compromising the future needs of those who come after us. As COVID wound down, our group began meeting regularly to find a path forward which didn't depend on big policy actions. We wanted something we could do right now in the most concrete ways, and you've heard about the food waste issues. So we come from, in this community group, we come from all different backgrounds and all different levels of expertise. Um, educators, those who are volunteer gardeners, um, those who work with outdoor and nature education, business people, scientists, clergy, parents, project managers, and so on. But we are all want to move sustainability in the agenda in this NMPS forward. One of our actions first was to design and, con and conduct a community survey, the results of which you have before you. The top, um, top issue was food waste. And so tonight, um, others have talked about that. But in the midst of our meeting and really beginning to work together, we looked at school models across the country where sustainability has been successful for a long time. And two things rise to our attention. Those school districts that were successful all had hired a chief sustainability officer and that work was preceded by having a group of individuals in the community who were stakeholders with the experience of the areas of sustainability. And they were active in the participation in guiding decisions of the officer. So we are asking that NNPS follow that successful pattern. We know that the sustainability officer has been part of the aspirational budget for two years now, and we are asking that you move it into the regular budget so that hiring take place. And we ask you to support the Sustainability Advisory Stewardship Committee to help guide you. We can marshal funds to help but mostly we can marshal a network of people and community groups who have expertise in all of these areas and who have hands-on experience and can allow things to be done and get started and continue to develop. Thank you. Thank you. James Lyles. Good evening, board members. My name is James Lyles and I live in District 4. I'm here today on behalf of Airbox, a division of AM Technical Solutions, to provide you with a solution to help defeat the fear of returning to school and to harden your educational environments against airborne pathogens. My company, Airbox, 
is the nation's leading provider in portable certified HEPA air purification systems that bolster best-in-class warranties as well as state-of-the-art smart fleet management software. It allows the end user to control and schedule on an enterprise level every air box via a single web portal. The fleet management software offers, offers real-time monitoring and feedback of air quality, including CO2, relative humidity, temperature, and filter lifespan. The software provides you the ability to manage your airbox fleet with scheduled runs, reducing operating costs, such as utilities and filter life from a single desktop. Airbox uses only HEPA filters that are individually certified to remove 99.9% .9 of all particles greater than 0.01 microns. 95% of the air purifiers sold in the United States do not remove pathogens. Airbox will remove greater than 99.9% .9 of all particles, including the COVID-19 virus in our school district. Airbox and our team of over 800 bioengineers provide the industry's only safe air plan based on your square footage within the space and peak occupancy. Airbox bioengineers can, plan, can provide a plan customized to your facility's specific needs at no upfront cost to you. You can take comfort in distributing this plan to your staff and parents alike, letting them know that their safety and well-being of their children is at the forefront of your agenda. Using ESSER funds provided for COVID mitigation, creating a pathogen-hardened safe air solution for school systems should cost as little as 5 to 8% total of your ESSER funding. My hope is Metro Nashville Public Schools will be the, tor the torchbearer for clean air solutions, and our educational system will be back to where it once was in regards to the degradation of attendance and standardized testing scores. Our partner school systems and universities can testify that leveraging Airbox consistently improved their budget stability and bolstered their educational enterprises. I welcome you to invite me back so I can give you a greater presentation to the capabilities of our product and leveraging it into your enterprise, the school system, and I'll follow up with an email tomorrow. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And that concludes our public participation. Please, oh, thank you all for coming to speak with us. Please remember to sign up for next month's meeting in the 1st of July. All right, we will now move on to Director of Schools Contract, Dr. Gentry. Uh, yes, so each of you should have received an email from John Whitaker uh, that had uh, both a cover memo and a uh, copy of the updated, of the Directors of Schools contract renewal. Uh, that uh, cover memo showed the, uh, highlighted the changes that are a part of the uh, contract that we are being asked to approve tonight. So I'll simply walk through uh, those um, changes for the benefit of those uh, in the audience and watching. So just uh, gonna walk through the, the section. So we had a, an active contract with Dr. Battle and the action tonight is to renew that contract with the following changes. The effective date of the contract uh, it will be entered in effective date July 1, 2022. As part of the introduction in section one called term, we're changing the commencement date and through date of the contract to commence on July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2026. Section two, extension or renewal. We're changing. Excuse me, Ms. Chintry. I think you might be reading from an older version of the memo. <laughs> I have a newer, the newer version. Came out a day later. Such a flow, though. <laughs> oh, it's gala. Thank you. You're all. Hello. Hello. I will begin again. 
This one isn't highlighted, you make me read now. Okay, so in the introduction section, the employment contract will be entered in into on June 14th, that's today, 2022. Uh, in section one term, the terms of the contract will commence on June 14th, 2022 through June 13th, 2026. Those two dates being inclusive. Section two, extension or renewal. The change there is that this contract, if the, uh, let me read the whole sentence. If the board intends not to renew this contract, the board shall notify the director of its intention not to renew this contract no later than January 1, 2026, um, and no later than each subsequent January 1 that this contract is in effect. The next change comes in section nine. Uh, base salary, the base salary itself does not change. I'll say that again. The base salary itself does not change. Uh, it just changes in that sentence, the beginning date, which is June 14th, 2022. Also in section nine, uh, it formally read that the base salary shall only be increased by action of the board. The change is, additionally, the base salary shall increase by the same percentage granted through any cost of living increase for all MNPS employees that takes effect at any time during the course of this contract. Section 10 on the fringe benefits, section C, personal leave, item I, vacation. It previously read that Dr. Battle shall be entitled to two days of vacation leave for each month. It, the change is Dr. Battle shall be entitled to three days of vacation leave for each month. Yes, after a pandemic, she's asking for one extra day. And of course, the signature line changes um, from Anna Shepard as board chair to Christian Bugs as board chair. All the other terms and conditions of the original contract, which was also attached for your reference, remain unchanged. With that, Madam Chair, I move approval of the contract renewal for Dr. Battle. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, open for discussion. All right, Mrs. Tyler. Um, so it's the job of this board to evaluate our one employee, Dr. Battle. And I, frankly, I'm surprised that a contract renewal is coming to the board before this year's evaluation has taken place. And, and I think it does us no favors to ignore our duty to officially evaluate Dr. Battle. If our teachers have to be evaluated in the middle of the stress and mess that this past year was, then we should not hold our superintendent to a different standard. I expect that we will not neglect that duty to complete our yearly evaluation, um, but that we will have an evaluation for this past year. Now that being said, I wanna make it crystal clear that while I firmly believe we should have already completed another evaluation of Dr. Battle, my support of her is strong. Um, I am aligned with her vision for MMPS, and I have been especially impressed by the deal she's created with local colleges and universities for our students to attend on full scholarships. Um, when I have had concerns, I have felt comfortable bringing them to her attention. And we have had some very honest conversations about some tough subjects, and I expect that we will continue to be honest with one another about our expectations and the results. Um, not having been part of the board when her original contract was created, I was actually kind of dismayed to realize that a cost of living increase was not already included. Um, the new language that um, Ms. Gentry, Dr. Gentry just read says that her base salary shall increase by the same percentage granted through any cost of living increase for all MNPS employees. And that means that she only receives that cost of living increase if every MNPS employee receives the cost of living increase. And from what I understand, this is typical for superintendent contracts. And I was surprised that it wasn't in the original language of the contract. Um, Dr. Battle deserves the same consideration and respect other superintendents across our nation receive. Um, another change to the contract adds the extra vacation day a month, and Dr. Battle has rarely taken the vacation she's already entitled to take, and while I know that there's a cultural push to work until you drop, we all know that that pace will lead to burnout and a drop in performance. All our employees deserve to have a better work-life balance. Dr. Battle's no exception. So when I was... 
spent a lot of time struggling <laughs> with this. Um, and my decision kind of boils down to several factors. Uh, one, knowing that I align with Dr. Battle's vision of MMPS and what she hopes to accomplish here. Um, two, that knowing that Dr. Battle has been willing to engage in hard conversations and she's been receptive to making changes when necessary. Um, and three, I want us to still conduct our yearly evaluation of Dr. Battle. And then four, knowing that research shows that students benefit from sustained leadership at the superintendent level. Um, so because of those things, um, I am in favor of MMPS continuing under her leadership. And I will vote yes on this contract. All right, Dr. Ginger. And I just want to say so that everybody hears, this does not have anything to do with the next evaluation, which will be happening soon. Yeah, I know. Okay. All right, be there no further questions? Okay. Um, Mrs. Poopa Walker, Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Elrod. I just want to uh, make a couple of remarks here um, tonight. So uh, Dr. Battle now has served three years, one of them as an interim, two as, a, as director of schools. Um, and it was one of the most uh, important days of my tenure on this board uh, on the day that we voted to name her as permanent director of schools. And I felt like it was the right call then, and I feel like it was the right call today. And I'll just talk a little bit about why I, I believe that. And so for those of us that were on the board at that time, the level of instability and rhetoric and the amount of times we were in the news for hyper dysfunction, um, it was not a good time to be, well, most of my tenure has been not a great time to be on the board, but I will say that that was, ex that was a brutal way to start. And, and, and so one of the hallmarks of her tenure has been to establish stability. Um, and that stability has then um, engendered her support from our mayor in the form of huge budget increases, bigger than we've ever received before, support from our council, support from university presidents, support from um, all kinds of folks in this city who believe in her vision and her leadership and have faith in, in what she brings to the district. Um, I want to commend her for increasing teacher pay to the point now where we have the best paid teachers in the state. Um, even during the pandemic, we had some of the lowest vacancy rates we've ever had, but perhaps maybe the, lo the lowest uh, in many, many years. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the partnership she's created, which we don't talk about really, but I think is tremendously important is the relationship with Peabody with Vanderbilt on doing research on the work that we do, exploring the hard questions, finding solutions. A lot of times people don't want to dig under that, don't want external folks looking at what our challenges are and what the solutions are, and to say we want the best education school in the country to examine um, what's happening here and how we can improve, I think is a testament to her. Um, I totally agree that we should be doing evaluations. They should be data-driven. We should be having frank conversations about how um, Dr. Battle or any director is doing. But I do think the structure of the focused outcomes that we have developed here as a district um, and the regular reports that we get on the progress on those focused outcomes give me a lot of confidence in how we're doing. I also want to note that the budget process that Dr. Battle created for us is unlike any we've seen before. Um, transparent, thoughtful, designed around our priorities, gives us a menu of things to consider. Um, that's not a small thing for a board to be able to look at a budget uh, process and, and decision making in that way. Um, I also want to say that I, I know we've gotten um, support and a lot and criticism for the COVID uh, response of being remote and, and all of those things. But I think throughout that process, Dr. Battle was seen as a city leader. Um, and she was called on um, on many, many occasions to speak not only for our district, for our, for our city, um, but the, the work, the mountains that were moved to get one-to-one -one laptops, nurses in every school, um, hubs, uh, the support hub model of having sites across the district to get support to families, and then the really um, walking and chewing gum ability to focus on academics, tutoring, promising scholars, all of these things her teams did, and focusing on student well-being, teacher well-being, mental health. Um, it's just not a, a small undertaking, and I, I really respect that about her, um, 
high expectations for her team for this for this district. Um, and I will also say, even tonight, she exhibited courageous um, leadership calling out gun violence. Um, I think that she has spoken out and defended our district. She has criticized state leaders at her own, potentially our district's expense. Um, she has um, spoken truth when it needed to be spoken, um, and I appreciate that. Um, and I do feel like um, when you've, if you've walked through a school with her and students see her, you see the absolute respect and the um, the love for her that staff and students have, um, and I, I want to say that you know we should never extend a, a contract for fear of, of losing someone. That's not the reason you should do it. But I do think we should pay attention when s districts like Clarksville, Montgomery, don't renew a, 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 a superintendent. They lose really big talent. Um, I suspect if we didn't vote to renew her today, we would, she would be getting calls tomorrow to go somewhere else. I really believe that. And so um, I think um, us renewing today is a signal for that continued stability, for continuing this path, for um, promoting our own, continuing to support our own, uh, our own graduate, our own Nashvilleian, our own leader. Um, and I am really grateful to work with you, Dr. Batten. So that is the end of my comments. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Bush and then Mrs. Elrod. You know, I struggled with uh, seeing this on the agenda tonight. And just so you know, it's not your fault, what I'm about to say, okay? This is a committee's problem. I know I had an opportunity to talk to Mr. Little, which I really appreciate our conversation surrounding the last evaluation, which was not a uh, director's evaluation. It was an evaluation of her team. It was an evaluation of departments. It was an evaluation of different programs. It was not a director's evaluation. So some of you all chuckled because I didn't take three or four hours out of my life to waste my time. And other people, leaders in this uh, city, journalists, uh, members of the media, also had an opportunity to review this contract, I mean the uh, director's evaluation that Sharon, you put together so poorly, and it was not, you can laugh, and they all said it, this was not a director's evaluation. Now, back in 2020, it was pretty much a line that it was an, uh, a director's evaluation that was pretty much more direct on performance. And that's exactly what I want to see is performance. And we missed the opportunity, again from you, Sharon, that we didn't even get at last year's evaluation. And, it, and we have to do due diligence when it comes to our city business for our kids, meaning we have to make sure that we go through a process of our one employee to make sure that we evaluate her. And that didn't happen. So the only evaluation that that is more so the director's evaluation or what we've evaluated back in 2020 is the only one that I can go off of. This last one was a flop. It was a flop and it was not an evaluation of the director. And we are missing still two years of evaluation and performance because I believe in performance and I believe in data. And that's something that we don't have. It's not your fault. Because I go off of what I see in front of me as far as evaluations. And it's supposed to be a due process. And it's supposed to be done correctly so that way we can be able to follow her performance. But you failed to do that. Mr. Little did take time out with me and I had shared my concerns when I first saw that crap. And he also agreed that he didn't think that it was an evaluation, but you're the chair. At that time, he agreed to it. I'm not sure where he stands now. But I did have a robust conversation surrounding about this so-called director's evaluation. Now, I'm gonna abstain from the vote because I believe that this is something that I can't, I, I can't, my conscience will not even think about uh, a contract when we don't have the data in front of us, when we don't have the performance evaluations before us. And that is something that we fail to do. 
and there was no accountability, but tonight I'm gonna hold you accountable because you failed at it. And that's the reason why we're in this situation when we're talking about evaluations because it wasn't done. So take accountability, the reason why I feel the way I do about not voting for this contract. And I'm very shocked on why we're even talking about a contract when we're two years out. Two years out, what's the rush? What's the rush? Can you tell the city why we're pushing this and we're rushing through this process when we haven't done our due diligence as far as the correct way of evaluating our one employee? And it hasn't been done. So saying all of that, and I can come back and I can further discuss of whoever want to challenge what I'm saying, that this is the reason why I'm going to abstain for this contract. It's not your fault. It's just it wasn't done correctly. It was not done correctly. And we have one director's evaluation, and that's all I can go off on. And I believe in doing, going through the due process. I believe in looking at performance, and I believe in doing it the right way. So saying that, I will be abstaining for this vote to renew your contract at this time. Thank you, Ms. Elrod, Mrs. Tyler, and Dr. Gentry, and then Mr. Little. Hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah you're good. Okay. Write it down. Um, okay, I, um, I, I first wanna make sure that we're aware that there has been more than one evaluation. Um, I do, do wish that we had done one maybe more recently. Um, some of you may remember when we first uh, appointed and hired Dr. Battle, um, a comment that I made was that the, to, to Jeannie's point, excuse me, Ms. Poopa Walker's point, um, the, the, the vibe was off and it was not comfortable. And one of my concerns with Dr. Battle's appointment at that time was that we, it may be viewed as not thorough enough, it may be viewed as this, that, or the other, and I was afraid as her manager that it would hurt her and that it would also hurt us as a board and that we had worked really, really hard, um, at least some of us, to really try to show transparency and involvement and in being here. And I didn't want that to go backwards. And so part of my concern has been um, that that's done and that we are transparent with it. That said, we have done two evaluations. Um, and that evalu part of the reason why is the evaluation process has changed. Now, it should be known, maybe for some historical context based upon the comments that were just said, uh, Dr. Gentry was involved with director's evaluations previously before Dr. Battle mm -hmm. under our past director of schools, Dr. Joseph. Uh, Dr. Gentry and um, someone that was a colleague at that time, Will Pinkston, was in charge of it. And we actually won some awards based upon that process. And they got invited to speak to people and all kinds of stuff. It was a big dang deal. And it was really, really, really thorough. And there were lots of complaints, frankly, from my colleagues about how long it took, because it was exhaustive. But it was exceptional. And it was really, really good. Um, and then because your employee, and Dr. Battle is our sole employee, um, is supposed to have a view and comment and position within the measures that they are evaluated by. Um, and that is that is not just in schools, that is within all businesses, that is that comes from even my corporate background, I promise y'all, that they're supposed to have some type of view in that. We decided to pause that and consider what's the next best process. And we've had several meetings. At one point, I was the evaluation chair. Then I was not. Then it was uh, Dr. Gentry. Then it was Dr. Gentry and John as vice chair of it. Um, and there's been discussions, um, mo more so outside of my tenure, where they have discussed um, that evaluation process, what it was going to look like, who was going to be involved, how long it was going to take, what the um, processes would be behind it, what was um, the evidence behind that as well, and how that would be hopefully not just transparent, but transformal, and, uh, or transformative, excuse me. And we've had several meetings about that, and there's not been, there's not been concerns from my colleagues about it. There's actually been a lot of people that have thought it was the right option. I actually disagreed with some of those colleagues and thought that we should maybe go back to the thing that we had won the awards for and it took forever. Um, I, I, that's kind of what I thought we should do. But 
my colleagues disagreed with me and thought that this was the right thing to do, that it was evidence-based still, it was more timely, it was better understandable by constituents and the public, which is important, and that it was also able to be done multiple times, so it wasn't just an annual or biannual process, that we could even maybe update it and do it quarterly if we needed to. And I have thought that that was a good process. Um, mostly because of the involvement that has been had with people trying to figure out how to do that. And there's been a lot of feedback from our colleagues. So I first wanna make sure that we're clear that yes, I mean, I would love to do another evaluation, sure, before we did this this year. Um, but that is again, because my job as one of Dr. I'm sure she loves having nine bosses, y'all. As one of her nine bosses, um, my job is to be a good manager, and that requires to provide trust, transparency, responsibility, accountability, but also there needs to be some vulnerability within that. She needs to be able to say what she needs for help, and I need to be able to say whether I can give that or not. And that also includes our own MMPS resources, not just my own. And so for that reason, I'm always an advocate for us doing those evaluations and doing them frequently and often. So I say that by, I hear y'all, I think we have a good process. I think we all agree that those would have been, that we're starting a new process, maybe we'll also win some awards with this one too. So that said, I wanna make sure that we're clear that there has been more than one evaluation. Um, they have not been the evaluations of the past, but that was decided upon with a lot of input from the board and that the board was really an encouragement of that process as well. Um, I um, I remember that meeting really clearly. I know some of y'all, I know some of you, were probably here when we had that meeting where we um, hired Dr. Battle. It was a full house. And it was, uh, I like to consider it the day before everything broke. Um, <laughs> and that has nothing to do with Dr. Battle. But it was such a stressful time for all of us. And it was um, an incredible moment of where we were trying to figure out how to steady the ship within MMPS within all the environmental factors that we were dealing with. And I've really appreciated your commitment to MMPS, not only in your professional life, from you know being a graduate of Overton, but also within your work. I mean, I, I do want to brag that she's yeah, a, grad, yeah. a graduate <laughs> of Overton. I'll, I'll pick that up. <laughs> but, but also within all of MMPS, um, I would like to say also, that is not always noticed, though she, a lot of her experience, whether it was as a student or professional experience was in South Nashville, Dr. Battle is a fierce advocate for all districts and for all parts of MMPS. I mean, I'm from South Nashville. I represent South Southeast Nashville. I want her sometimes to prefer South Southeast Nashville because that's my job. But she is a fierce advocate for us, for them all. And she sees all students, not just the ones that she remembers the most from her own experience, which I appreciate. There, of course, are areas where we all have growth, and we have make sure that we notice those that is the main core of our job through that evaluation process. So on that note, I do hope, and I'm sure that we have a date at the end of this of when something's gonna happen or what we think we're gonna do with the next one. I hope that everyone participates because that feedback is the needed feedback for not only st the strategic vision of MMPS, but also for Dr. Battle. A lot of times our evaluation, so you know, it does include information about programs, processes, and we'll say pushes within the school system. That's because again, these, oh sorry, these are not our employees. They are Dr. Battle's employees but they are doing the strategic vision that we have said to get done. And so it's their responsibility to do it. Now it's not my responsibility to say, go get it done. That is Dr. Battles and I hope she does it better than I just did. But that is why that information is in there. So it is not strategically and it is purposely not just Dr. Battles said X, Y, and Z. There are absolutely comments in there about specific divisions, departments, programs, policies, procedures, budgetary needs, things that we see are needed, whether it's inside the city's needs, our state needs, which are so drastic, 
and sometimes legal needs even. All of that is set inside of there. So I want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of the evaluation and how that is needed and necessary and exceptionally important to the transparent needs of not only our director of schools, but all director of schools. And I hope that everyone participates and that we have a robust program coming soon. I thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Elrod, Mrs. Tyler, mm -hmm. Ms. Or Dr. Gentry, and then Mr. Little. Um, and I just want to go back and just, I know I said I struggled with this decision. I want to make it absolutely clear the struggle had nothing to do with your capabilities. Um, that Dr. Battle, I've said my vision aligns with yours. I don't think that that's strong enough to say, to, to make people understand the type of work that you have to do for a, a, a district as large as ours. And the type of vision and will you have to have to pull things off. Um, and I want to make it clear that I am fully 100% supportive of you as our leader. My concern has been what will the public perception be of completing, of giving an extension before completing another evaluation. And I want to make sure that the the public is aware that this is not being made based on feelings, and but that it is being made based on um, measurable things. And, and I know we've been talking about going back, and you know I, I've only participated in one, um, but I did get the first one from 2020 shared with me, and so I was able to go through that and look at those measurable things. And I have been able clearly, as we've tracked our way through here, we've kept up with the way things have gone, our reading scores, our literary literacy scores, our math scores. Um, and we have seen from one of the most devastating times from for the entire country in educate for the entire world in education that we have already brought ourselves back up. I mean, that's huge. I, I don't know that people understand how big of a deal that is, that we are back at baseline when the pandemic isn't over yet because it's still not. We're at high level right now today in Davidson County. So I want, I just, I have to make it absolutely clear to you that my confidence in you is absolute. And I want to make it clear to the public that my confidence in Dr. Battle is absolute and that I appreciate what she does and I support it fully, 100%. Um, any concern or struggle I have had has been about making sure that we do the steps in the proper order so that we are not, so that you are not undermined and act and, and have people be able to come back and say that you only got an extension because of something, who knows what. I want you to know this is not just a respect that I have personally for you, but that I also have seen the good you have done for MMPS and that that is trackable, that is data driven, and that I recognize that and that's why I am supportive of you. Um, and I really want you to to stay and to continue to work with us. Um, I, I, this is the vision that, that I had hoped for when I joined the board. So I, I would like to continue to see that through as long as we can. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gentry and then Mr. Little. Yeah, so thank you for those words. I think that was the word I was looking for. So I just want to be clear, like the, the renewal is not based on an evaluation and it should never be. It really should be on the day-to-day -day performance and engagement that we have with our employee. Um, to the comments about the, the evaluation itself, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, there was Apple opportunity to provide input into the structure and the content and what elements of the strategic plan we would be evaluating. Um, and in the myriad of text messages I received asking for more time to complete the evaluation, no one asked for a conversation about the content of the evaluation. I just continued to wait for the evaluation to be completed by the entirety of the board. So I do appreciate the engagement and the conversation. I hope that the next evaluation chair will take this feedback and at the next retreat we will sit down and take a look at this tool and see if it is the right tool going forward. We do this every time we meet. 
It is a part of what we do. With regards to what is included in an evaluation, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to work with a CEO or closely with a CEO, there's not a single CEO that is teaching a class. There's not a single CEO that is a principal of a building. There's not a single CEO that is doing security or doing maintenance or doing any of the myriad of the nine million functions that take place to meet the objectives of our strategic plan. The CEO of an organization, which Dr. Battle is, gets the work done, gets executes on the strategic direction of the board through her or his team. And so it may look like an evaluation of departments because it is. It's an evaluation of whether or not the CEO has articulated a vision that has set the right expectations, has indicated what the right outcome should be to move the needle in the direction that the board has set. And so I don't know what, if, you, if we expect the evaluation to say Dr. Battle did, and if Dr. Battle ever came to this board table and started a sentence with I <laughs> did, that would be a problem because she doesn't do it alone. She does it through her team. And so I, I, don't, I don't know what different language we could use to make people comfortable that it is a direct evaluation of Dr. Battle, but it is a direct evaluation of Dr. Battle because she gets her work done through her direct reports and it trickles down from there. Um, so um, that's, that's all I want to contribute to that. Hopefully we'll be after Dr. I mean, Mr. Little will be moving forward with whatever the decision is. All right, Mr. Little. Right, thank you. And, and I think I, I second what everybody's saying. We have homegrown talent um, in Dr. Battle. I wish this, this is, I guess as I listen to everybody's comments and how I feel personally, this isn't about Dr. Battle, but it's about the thousands of kids that we usher in. And as I listen to this discussion, I don't, I don't want to rush it. I don't want to wait. I think we have a new board, up to four, four different board members coming in by August or September. And I, I think it's an opportunity to take a step back. Um, look at the evaluation process, how people have an opinion, whether it's yay or nay, and figure we do something in September or the board does something in September or October. When I looked around, you know, our roles and responsibilities as a school board, it's hiring and managing a director of schools, which we do, it's allocating resources and encouraging fiscal responsibility, which we have a budget um, over a billion dollars. It's promoting continuous improvement, which I like to look at as academic improvement. And then it's, you know, informing and engaging the community as we do here with public comment, getting it in the, the yays and the nays as parents and community members are able to come up. I think from my standpoint, and, and sometimes it's different, that's, it's almost business as usual. I, I think that's great. And this conversation, again, it has nothing to do with the director, but our biggest focus should be if we are running a school system, a school system created for amazing teachers, amazing students. I think we also, and maybe this is something in the future, we look at the outcomes of the students we serve. Um, and as we work in our communities and we hear the great things and we hear the fairy tales that are going well where kids are really becoming leaders in our community, we also hear the horror stories. And so what I would love to do is just look at the data as we have TCAP and so we can make informed decisions on the system and the process itself, but also how we serve our children who come through the MMPS system. Um, for me, it would be, and, and we'll see where the motion goes, it'll be for me to allow the new board the opportunity to vote on it and give this board a chance to make the determining factors on how our students in our community um, are doing academically and being able to leave 12th grade, um, whether it's post-secondary or whether it's a trade school or whether it's armed forces. But I, I think in the future, we should base an evaluation based on how the people we serve. Thank you. Mrs. Player Peters and then Mrs. Pupa Walker. Um, I disagree with my colleague about postponing it, just because as someone who came in uh, filling the appointment, um, filling a vacancy of someone um, and coming into an evaluation um, a process, I can tell you if I did not have the experience with Metro schools and Metro government, it would have been a difficult and, and 
I don't say impossible, um, a difficult evaluation to do. Um, just because of my work through my previous, with two previous employers through SEIU and also through the mayor's office, I had a very unique perspective of observing um, MMPS and, and the leadership at the time. Um, and so I would do not think that for new school board members that we should wait for the contract. We want to do about evaluation and how to redesign the evaluation is a different discussion and that we can bring the new school board members in in the design of it. Um, but also I think it goes back to um, the purpose of renewing the contract. We, it's our responsibility to manage a system and to govern over that system and how we do that. How we set that is amongst ourselves. We are also responsible for the leadership of that system outside of the nine of us. Um, and I think at this point in time, the point of renewal is do we sustain the leadership we have or we move on to some, someone else? And I believe we should sustain the leadership that we have for several reasons. From the very beginning, our leader, Dr. Battle, has had sustained support from the entire community. It has been consistent. It has been thorough, and it has been, um, it has been, um, lack of a better word, uh, been approved, for lack of a better word. Um, and so I think that's, that's the first part. The second part is um, this should be done, as we said, separate, because the evaluations also work on how we engage with our employee, how we improve <coughs> the systems that we manage her, and also the ways that we do put support and resources around that evaluation. The evaluation isn't one-sided, as in we evaluate the director of schools, yes, and we give a report and we do that. But also we have to look at how do we also support that one employee. When you're in management, when you do an evaluation, it shouldn't be just one-sided, it should be a two-way conversation of how do you build support to make sure they succeed. Now, if they don't succeed with that support, then that's a discussion that we need to have amongst the nine of ourselves with leadership. But that's a different discussion than renewing the contract. The renew of the contract is simply to sustain the leadership we have. As Dr. Gentry says, the day-to-day -day work, has it been sufficient or superior to maintain and with that management? I believe it has. Um, I believe that what we have accomplished in the last three years, given, given through a pandemic, through everything we have, that your leadership should be sustained. And I think that's the core part of renewing the contract of whether the leadership should be sustained. And if we do that, the next part is how we continue with the evaluation process. But the evaluation process is on us as leaders and how we do that. So I think it's two separate things that we deal with as of right now, as we consider raises for our employees, as we advocate with Metro Council for what's going on, that's separate from what the employees go through their evaluation process with their principals, with their bosses. So I think it's two separate things that we have the same kind of standard that we have with Dr. Battle. And I moved the previous question. All right, you, I'm sorry, repeat that. Oh, I moved the previous question. You moved the previous question. You moved to call the question? Call the question, sorry. Okay. Sorry. So she has now moved to call the question. Mrs. Pupo Walker, Mrs. Masters, you were in the queue. I hadn't spoken yet, but we will uh, vote. As long as it's passed with the two-thirds vote, we will move on to the vote. So she's called the question. Ms. Or Dr. Gentry, please repeat your motion. I move approval of the contract renewal for Dr. Battle. All right, all in favor to call the question, please raise your hand. Okay, so it does not pass. All right, so we will move on to Mrs. Pupa Walker and then Mrs. Masters. I just want to um, say that I actually take umbrage with my colleague, Mr. Little's comment that we should let a new board have this uh, responsibility. Um, I'm a sitting board member. That next board can overturn this decision if they so choose. I've spent four years in this seat. I have spent many hours on my one-on-one -on -one meetings with Dr. Battle uh, and phone calls and all the rest, giving feedback, pushing, uh, thought partnership, um, working together. Uh, I think I have a pretty good understanding, um, in fact, better than uh, new board members might have in September. Um, and so I, I would like to 
just make that point that I think I'm ready and able to make this call today. Thank you, Mrs. Masters. All right, I'm sorry, I was sitting here like, I trying to decide if I have anything meaningful to add. Um, this has been another one of these moments with this board where I, I'm appreciative of this entire discussion and what everyone has sort of brought into it. Um, and I understand where Mr. Little is coming from with this because we are close to an election. Um, uh, and I have respect for what Ms. Bush is saying about concerns about us not having yet reviewed this most recent school year. Um, I read the evaluation from 2020, and I really tried to put myself in that place of that was before I was on the board. Um, I was a parent at that time who wrote a letter to my school board member urging her to um, go ahead and appoint <laughs> Dr. Adrian Battle um, as the director of schools. Um, and so I was coming at it from that parent place. So to look at the evaluation from 2020, um, and try to put myself in that place and look at what some of the recommendations there were. Um, it was to um, create a position for diversity and inclusion. Um, it, there were a lot of things that were listed as outside of framework, as you can imagine, from 2020. Um, and so the dual opening plan, for example, was one of those sort of turning on a dime, figuring out how to move forward. Um, the need uh, for the director of schools to take a more active role in pressing for higher pay for staff um, and teachers. So, um, you know, I looked at, at the expectations that were sort of set forth as a result of the 2020 review and tried to determine have those been fulfilled or has there been a genuine attempt to fulfill those. Then in the review that I was able to participate in, yeah, I'm very cognizant of the fact that we, we now should be looking back at those metrics and we should be moving into another review period. Um, so, yes, do I wish we had that under our belts right now? I do, but I'm trying to look at that larger picture and the fact that this board existed and that Dr. Battle was appointed before I joined the board. Um, <coughs> That to say, um, and, I, and oh, and there is one concern for me right now. We don't have a chief of HR right now, and so I do have concerns around that. But I will also say that whenever I've had concerns in areas like that, is, oh, no, okay, yeah, that um, Dr. Battle is open to the discussions around that. So I'm appreciative of that. Um, I also fall to the research that longevity of superintendent um, tenure is a major indicator of student success, um, starting with as short a period of time as two years, and then moving forward from there. Um, so that that is a um, a distance I'm willing to travel. So. Anyway, everybody else is talking. I just felt like I need to talk too. And I want everybody to know I read the 2020 evaluation too. Um, and I and that I don't take I, I don't take issue with what anyone else has shared. I think it's all been really valid and and reasonably presented and I'm really a, appreciative of that and, and how we are able to communicate. Um, yeah. That's it. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Mr. Little. Yeah, and, and again, I'll echo I wish we can take, this is, this is more not about extending the contract. This for me is looking at how do we effectively evaluate a director of schools in the, in the near future? How much do we put into account how students are progressing after they leave our school system? And so doing the evaluation and taking into account, like as I look at, I mean, I used to be in the crowd during the last superintendent and the superintendent before that, and things were really topsy-turvy. I think as I talk to people in Donaldson, Hermitage, and O'Hickory, as I hear from people around Dr. Battle being homegrown, going to our schools, participating in sports, but again, like for me, 
I would love to see something that really shows where we are academically. When I was reading up on some reports, it said, you know, there's a state law that's tied that says that your TCAP should be tied to some of your final grades. And as I was looking back at an article in 2014, it said it hasn't been that way for several years. And as I fast forward to 2022, we still don't have that. And I want to, I've always had the question of, like, how do we provide data that shows three years, five years, maybe 10 years at the 10 year class reunion that we look at how our students are doing? Because it's one thing to create this amazing system, but if the kids who come out of the system aren't able to reach their full potential, when you think about Nashville, how expensive it is, when you think about expensive living, um, low paying jobs for kids who don't have college degrees, we find ourselves, if you look into a trend that Natives who helped build this city, who were invested in our public schools, don't get a chance to grow with our city. And so I'm, I'm taking names out, and I just hope in the near future that we can really look into how do we support the students post post high school? Like, how do we get a good understanding of where they are? How do we make sure natives of Nashville and graduates of our public school system are still alive and thriving and not having to move out of our city? When I looked at my old neighborhood, my family bought our house on 2533 McGinnis Drive, which for 86000 I went over there. I still got the same neighbor, Jackie Daniels. He says every time somebody comes over to look at it, he lets the dogs out. And I was like, well, let me see how much it costs to buy it. And it's $500,000 to, to buy a house that started off at 86000 And so this, for me, this is bigger. I mean, Dr. Battle is, she has risen to the occasion. She has been, she has taken on every challenge. Um, she has not shied away from any controversy. But again, like that's one side. And the other side is how are the people that we are elected to serve doing after they leave our school system? All right. All right. Uh, we have a motion on the table. Repeat that one last time, Dr. Gentry, so we may vote. I move that we approve the contract renewal for Dr. Battle. Thank you very much. All in favor, or uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Whitaker, do we have to do a roll call vote or? Okay. All in favor of renewal, please raise your hand. All right. All opposed? All abstaining? All right, motion passes. Thank you all for the discussion. We will now move on to the consent agenda, I'm sorry, the amended consent agenda. Uh, earlier in the day, we removed items 1B1 and 1B7, that's ABM industry groups and HES facilities. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? 1B1 and 1B7, one. Yeah. Okay. So moved. All right, do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please raise your hand. ABM. Mm -hmm. One seven. All right, passes unanimously. We will begin with number one, uh, ABM Industry Groups, Mrs. Tyler. All right. Um, so I, these are our custodial contracts. Both of them are, and um, I had brought up some concerns about them at our last meeting, and we deferred them to today. Um, so I have done a lot more deep digging, even more so than I had the last time that we talked. Um, I, I do want to say my concern has been that they had not been meeting their contractual obligations. Um, having had many conversations with principals and teachers, not just in my cluster, but throughout, the, especially during the pandemic, that there was um, a lack of cleanliness in the schools that was disturbing. Um, there was not always soap available. There were not always paper towels available. I mean, basic things that, you know, we would need to have to keep our students safe. Um, and then, so one of the things that I've gotten has been the MMPS custodial uh, scorecard, and so I've been looking at that to see how principals have rated the different, um, different principals have rated the custodial services at their group, and also to see um, when they're not staffed at 100%, and, and I see that the staffing is not always um, the same, I, you know, within the same school, I see it go from 100% to 60% to back to 100% to 80%. So, I um, mean, there's no telling if those are the same people or if they're just turning over and now we have new janitors or custodial services coming in um, and having to 
relearn what is happening for that particular school, what needs to have happen. So I know that in the RFP um, for these both of these contracts, that there was a clause that states that there should be quarterly meetings with MMPS management. And during those meetings, there should be provided status updates and we should be reviewing findings. So I just wanted to ask, um, are, are those meetings happening? Um, how frequently were they happening? And what were the outcomes of those meetings? Um, yes, they are definitely happening, but I would uh, like to invite Chief Sullivan up to the podium to respond more, specific, more specifically. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Thank you, Ms. Tyler. Uh, we do have the quarterly meetings, and um, uh, each group comes in, and we have our facilities team. I've sat in since I've been here as well, and um, we get a very voluminous report from, from the vendors, and they have their own scorecards. They get the principal scorecards, and they use those, and then their folks go out, and they create their own scorecard, and they share that with us. Um, they give us, um, I actually um, uh, shared the last one with the board, so y'all have seen the last written report from, from each, um, from that meeting, from each one of the vendors. Um, is that something? Is that what you shared? The powerpoints that you had shared with us yes, a couple weeks ago. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that that did have um, some information in it that that seemed to be basically from from them. I didn't notice the principal scorecards in there, but it's been a week since I've looked at it. Right. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that when a principal is looking at what is happening in their school as far as the custodial services, they are rating them based between one and five. And if a score goes less than a three, then that's flagged. Um, and that, that um, flag is supposed to, let me see, what does it say? That with the schools who have less than a three, it's an, at an actionable level, and that custodial leadership is supposed to visit the school, review the immediate needs of the school, and determine how to improve those scores. Um, the custodial vendors are also asked to provide the school with a written plan of action to correct deficiencies. Finally, the custodial vendors go through their own internal scoring and review of each school. Um, and then that's what your matrix of things was also included. Um, how frequently were those meetings happening and do we have access to these written plans that were supposed to go to our principals? We do. Um, as soon as we get scores from the principals every month, then we share that through David Prophet and his team. We share that directly with the, um, with the custodial supervisors and their zone managers go out and um, have those conversations and um, uh, have those meetings with the principals and uh, have meetings back with us and it becomes a, a conversation of um, how we can improve performance. Okay, I'm seeing several schools on here that their monthly scores are not going above three. <laughs> so what happens when a plan is made but it's not followed well enough for the principal to give them a better score? Uh, we continue to work with the zone supervisor. We continue to uh, to work with the um, with the management of the company, and we stay. Um, I can tell you that David Prophet and his team stay on it very, uh, very adamantly. And um, we have had we have had incidents com that were flagged. Um, we have seen good response to the actual incidents that were flagged by the principals to become corrected. And then the score may go down again or may be reflected for different incidents the next the next month. But we feel like they've the companies have been very responsive on correcting specific incidences as we know about them. Um. And what happens when a school has not been fully staffed for over a year? Is there any sort of follow-up we can do with them? What What is our, what can we do to ensure that our schools are all being fully staffed? 
Yes, that is um, something that we track every month and every quarter in conversations with the with the vendors. And as you see, it is part of their metrics that they have to meet. So it um, it is a uh, it is a seminal issue as part of these contracts that must be met. They um, both vendors have an eighty five to ninety five percent. Uh, retention rate among their teams, and that that does uh, happen after a year. So there is turnover uh, as as folks um, enter this line of line of work with these vendors. But um, but they do have lots and lots who have stayed for a long time and continue to work with them. And that, um, but we do continue to monitor the percentage of um, of staffing and continue to make that a large priority in our conversations with them, not just at the quarterly meeting, but on a monthly basis and weekly. Um, so in, within the contract, there is, um, would, would it be called a penalty if they don't meet a certain threshold? Is that, am I misunderstanding that? Um, I'm going to uh, just defer to my purchasing friends to be sure that mm -hmm. um, if, if that's all right, if, um, I don't know if that would... Act as a penalty if there would be. Are we asking about termination? No. Or an just, actual penalty? Just a penalty. An act, like it, an actual penalty. So, for example, I'm looking at three schools right now who all year long have been less than 100% staffed and have not given high scores. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly there's an issue at that particular school, at those particular schools. Um, and, and it's not one that has changed because over time you can see that it hasn't. So what are we doing if we continue to have conversations and sit down with them and then nothing changes? Mm -hmm. So we had it written in to the contract from a penalty perspective. I don't, I don't recall, it's been over two years since we wrote this one, an actual penalty for an individual school. But if a zone is failing and they're not picking up the zone, so each of the contractors are carrying three okay. zones apiece, that if they're unable to succeed in all three zones, then one of the zones could be offered to the other contractor to pick up that zone and therefore they would lose one of their zones in the process. But I don't think we have anything written in for an individual school penalty because we, I guess the assumption would be if they're able to do well in all the other schools in that zone, why can't that one that one school, you know, f we find a solution and pick it up there also. And how many schools tend to be in each zone? Well, I can't I can't recall off the top of my head. D David, do you? How many schools are in each zone, David? And what would classify as failing for a zone? How many schools would have to be negatively impacted to be classified as a failing zone? I can't answer that question specifically. Okay. Um, there's no we have no guideline on that, but mm -hmm. uh, the number of the zones are set up like our maintenance zones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so you have basically two high schools, um, like a maintenance zone. So we kept it that way so that they could track. They would have the same zone managers in maintenance who would also be out in the schools to keep mm -hmm. eyes on cleanliness as well. So, is it does it roughly break down to um, sort of even? even numbers in each zone? Both, both, um, both vendors have approximately 7 million square feet uh, of our total portfolio. <clears throat> um, I'm, I just, I think if we have a penalty, we should probably make sure that, that we're keeping an eye on what triggers that. Um, that is important to me that we're holding somebody accountable. Um, especially if it is having negative impacts on the school itself. Um, and that, in turn, will have a negative impact on the learning that can happen at that school. Um, and I know that, you know, I had several teachers who said that they'd been taking out the trash in their own classroom for the last two weeks of school. And that's not their job. Um, several of the principals had said that there wasn't um, soap in the bathrooms, and so teachers had spent their own money to make sure they had soap in their classrooms. And then it becomes an equity issue of who gets to be clean or not, who's spending the money that's not, that it, we've already paid to have spent. Um, and it's the job, it's a daily check that they are supposed to go into the bathrooms and they're supposed to not only clean them but check them and then refill what is not there. And if 
an item is not able to be refilled, then at that point it needs to be ordered and gotten out there as soon as possible. Or if it is, you know, being held, let's say, for example, at the high school where it's maybe in storage, that it would be moved directly to the school that needs it. Um, that's that should not be on the shoulders of our teachers or our principals to have to report because that's part of the job of the people who are working the custodial services to refill that without somebody looking over their shoulder. And when we ask our teachers and our principals to step in and m basically micromanage what's happening, we're taking them away from something else and we're adding something extra to their plate that should not be added to their plate because we're, so we're paying somebody else to do that. And I just have a real issue issue with um, a company that's not, or companies that don't meet that obligation. Um, and so I, I guess an, another question that I have is they had asked for a raise. Do we know what they're spending that money on? That's the same question I had. Do you have, um, yeah, we do have, an, an escalator built in uh, to a 4% escalator built into the contract. The companies um, have told us that, um, and David, get, correct me if I'm wrong, that 90% of that would be used um, straight directly to the employees and the rest to supplies. Is that correct? I was told 92 to 94% would be for wages and the rest of it is increased cost of of um, materials. materials and supplies. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to other folks in the in this line of work and uh, different governments uh, are just in the state of Tennessee and, and elsewhere and they are, um, all of their custodial contracts are increasing um, much higher than 4% uh, because of supply costs mostly, so. Okay. Um, and then I think just the last comment that I want to make about this is that um, I worked as a teacher for MMPS when we still had janitorial house, it was housed in-house. It was run by MMPS. Um, and, and I was also working for MMPS when we outsourced it. And there were a lot of people who chose to stay and took a pay cut to continue to do the work that they had been doing. Um, and so, I'm just wondering how much of their higher retention rate numbers are people who had already had a relationship at that school that they weren't willing to give up. Um, it, it had been a lifetime, what they had assumed, this is where I will work until I retire. And, and to be completely fair, that has nothing to do with the company or their ability to give them the things that they need or want to stay there and everything to do with the relationship that had been created prior to them coming in. Um, so I, I just, I, I have seen the, the schools where the janitorial services turned over and were no longer the same people because the same people decided they couldn't afford to take that pay cut and they had to go find a job somewhere else. Um, the people who came in, I saw a higher turnover rate from those groups than I saw from the people who had decided that they were willing to stay even with the pay cut. Um, and I just for the record, I'm not okay with them having to take a pay cut to continue to do that work. Thank you. Emily Masters. Yeah. yeah I, Are you next? I just, um, I want to echo that about the retention. I, I could tell you, I think of five or six off the top of my head um, that are in that situation where they're just really dedicated to their schools. Um, I just want to say, like, I am appreciative of the fact that this contract only goes through 20, June 2024, and I would like us as a board to make it a priority to bring our custodians back to being MMPS employees. I think that's something I'd really like us to look at. Um, in the budgeting process. Um, our hands are, I am told, tied um, as far as doing anything about the low wage being paid according to this contract because state law prohibits us from requiring um, more than minimum wage or even for prevailing. prevailing wage to be paid when it comes to things like construction contracts. All the more reason that these need to be our MMPS employees and we need to look at this as a budget priority um, moving forward. Thank you. 
I apologize, John. John. No, no, all good. And and I mean, echoing what uh, Ms. Masters and Ms. Tyler said, I've also heard that a lot of school buildings are not clean. And when you look at the contract, I think it's it's two things. And, and I have a question, um, Mr. Prophet. I, how much, so how much will it cost if we brought the custodians back under MMPS because I, I see, I, I remember when we privatized it, a lot of us were against it. My brother um, was a custodian himself and I remember, I think it was 2008 um, that he was he was fighting for his job, but just at that time, they said we didn't have the money and in, in, in order to keep the services, we would need to privatize. But I've also seen firsthand in multiple schools with everything that Ms. Tyler was mentioning. And so it may be, although we privatized it, it's still not enough money to completely do the job. And so when you look at, and I, if, if you can send me those those ratings, I think it'd be interesting to look at how people are rating the system, how much money are we spending in, in comparison to how much it would cost if we brought it back under the district's hub. That was a lot. I think we have, a, <laughs> I think we have um, kind of an estimate of how much it okay. would cost above and beyond. Yeah, so back in January of this year, um, I keep a running total of what it would cost to do something like that. And setting the wages at a minimum of what we would bring a, a, an employee in, um, we're talking a total of probably $30 million on top of this current uh, contract amount. So you'd be looking at about the mid-50s in order to do it. That includes bringing uh, trucks, supplies. Uh, you have an administrative staff you have to buy too. Uh, it's not just bringing custodians back in. You have to staff it uh, as a full department on top of that. And that's just an estimate. And right, right. So. Oh. Jeannie and then Fran. I just want to thank Ms. Tyler for all the homework she's done on this. This is a really important issue. A clean learning environment is important. Thank you. Fran? Um, thank you. Um, so I'm not interested in giving them a two-year contract. Um, I think we can. See, the problem I have with these contracts, and when I first got on board, that was one of the, the number one things I kept saying. We were, we're just, we're so top-heavy in our contracts. And um, because they have not fulfilled their obligations to our schools, that's what makes me a little nervous to do a two-year contract. And all we do is kind of, you know, fatten the pockets of those CEOs and the, comp the corporations, and yet it's not um, distributed among those, those, those uh, employees that work so hard. And that's the reason why they can't retain the staff that we need in order to make sure our schools are clean. Um, we can bring back our own people, and it may take a year to do that. I do think that if we could do a year contract, I think that would help a whole lot in order to put this back into our budget. Um, I'm just a little nervous about this because all we're going to keep doing is see the same cycle play over and over again with this contract, and there's no fulfillment as far as the responsibilities that they say in the contract that they're willing to do. So, I, you know. It, it's up to you guys, but I'm not really in favor of a two-year contract. I mean, I would go for that one-year contract just so we can be able to um, bring our own people back into the equation. So um, I'm just, it's, it's, it's an ongoing cycle, and I understand that we want to have something in place, but I just think this is the ongoing cycle that we're not being able to support our school's cleanliness, and I just think that we're going to be here again talking about it next school year, that they're still not fulfilling those, uh, those gaps and making sure that our schools are clean. And that's my comment. Thank you. Frida? So I have very intimate knowledge with this. Um, <laughs> I was literally the lobbyist and the um, political director for SEIU when this happened. So I am the one that literally had to tell employees that come July 1, they did not have a job or counsel employees whether to work for the new contractor or to seek new employment or to get unemployment. Um, so I get, I really do get the credit. Like, this is really personal to me. I, that's one of the reasons why I do not talk about it because I hate to get emotional and talk about it. But also, there's the real fact of bringing this back in-house. 
I would love to have it in-house. As budget and finance chair, I would do it. But if we're struggling to give our support, our current support employees, the raises that they request, that they want, that they advocate for, that we're not gonna be able to do this overnight. This has to be a thoughtful, strategic, um, phased-in process. And I think Dr. Bowden and her team are starting that by shortening the life of the contracts. This is gonna take some serious advocacy, A, from the community, from the mayor's office, and to the council because we're asking for 50 million new dollars. 50. With this new mayor, we've finally gotten about 103 new, new revenues, $100 million in new revenue, over the, during the term of his mayorship, working with the council, with the work of that, just to get us to where we want to for employee raises, to get us where we want to in social emotional learning, to get us where we want to in academic support. And so, to understand what the, he the heavy lift that it is, not that I'm saying it should not be done, because I'm, I will be right there leading the charge for it, but, but understanding what we're asking from the taxpayers mm -hmm. to make this happen in a quickly and efficient way. And so I think what we need to do as part of our strategic planning, as we go into our retreat, and as we go into next year's, and as we do the aspirational budget, how do we slowly phase this back into doing it in-house because as um, Mr. Prophet said, we have to deal with not only salaries, we have to deal with health care benefits, we have to deal with pensions, we have to deal with supplies. When we outsource the custodians, we had to sell off or sell off everything we had. So there's a whole new infrastructure that we can't put together literally in months. It's easy to dismantle in months, but to rebuild it literally takes months, if not a year, to do. So I think it should be a priority of this board to make to do it, but also we're talking about $50 million. And so we're gonna have some tough conversations with the community about where we're transferring those resources from. And I hope this board is willing to have those tough conversations because I remember having those tough conversations of, well, why should we keep a custodian? The courthouse is outsourced. The other place is outsourced, they're just custodians. Why should we do it? And I had to explain how the custodian is part of the community. I had to explain the infrastructure of that. And that takes time and question, that takes time and effort and a thorough campaign that we're gonna to have to do collectively to do that. So as we do that, I, I, can, I, I, I hope my colleagues will join us into having that conversation over time but this is going to have to be a stage process over s multiple years because how big our school is. We have 150 buildings that we have to maintain. Like, so it, it takes a lot, and that's thousands and thousands of employees. So I just want to be mindful of the implementation it takes to do that, that unless someone wins Powerball and wants to give <laughs> some money, which I'll be more than happy to make that financial ask, um, that we, we make a long-term plan of really how do we start phasing in, whether it's you know five schools, 10 schools, you know, by zone, but how do we plan that in, and also how do we build it in our budget over a couple of years? Because that's a lot of new revenue that we have to take, and that has to come from somewhere else. And that's going to take a lot of advocacy to the mayor's office and to the council to support something like that. Thank you. Abigail? Um, I just want to point out that the cost of these um, particular contracts, when you add them all together for one year, is 48 million dollars seven hundred forty eight million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars so it's not I mean what we're so we're saving two million is what I'm hearing that's roughly that's, that's exactly um, so yes uh, we do need to be thoughtful about bringing it back and I agree with you and I know that you are we're on I know we're on the same page as far as this goes but I do want to point out that you know in two years we're giving them almost a billion dollars I mean we're giving them 97 million dollars um, not to exceed and and so we ha we are already spending that money on them and 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 I know that it might be a little bit more to 
get started to get the supplies, to get the things to set up that, and then it's to maintain. It won't necessarily be quite as much because we already will own the things that we need to own at that point. Um, but, and, and again, I agree with you, it needs to be done in a way that is intentional and thoughtful. Um, but I don't want to act like that money doesn't exist in our budget because we're already paying it. Just for clarification, um, Ms. Tyler, we are talking about above and beyond the scope of the contract. Okay, so the $50 million would be above what we're, what we're That's paying? That's correct. I did not sorry. understand that. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> it's, 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 can I respond to that before? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. But we can throw you back in the loop. We, we have Mr. Little. I appreciate That makes time. a little bit more sense no. now. <laughs> we have Mr. Little. We retreat time. Ms. Elrod. Ms. Ms. Tupa Walker. You're out. All right, Ms. Player Peters. No, I mean, I, I think it's it's what I, I said on the low end. I need to get my numbers right. It was $30 million just looking at the... The bear, and then I saw 55.5. So I, maybe I need to get, but I don't know what that means because I too created a chart the the, the ceiling and then the floor, kind of the different numbers. But yeah, I maybe need some coaching in this as well. All right, Mrs. Elrod. Thank you. I was going to say this has been a long conversation on our board. I joined in 2018. It was actually um, an early conversation I know Ms. Poopa Walker and I had um, with. Um, Mr. Profit um, about what was that? What was the likelihood of it? And at the time, it was a lot of just big conversations. It was mostly qualitative data, um, and so we asked for some quantitative data on that and what was the actual numbers that would exist. And we, at the time, really appreciated that information um, that was given to the board at that time. And as we probably know, as citizens of Nashville and Davidson County, that number has only gone up exponentially, and the requirements that that would include has only gone up. But it is a priority, and it probably should still continue to be, I believe it should still be a priority of the board. Um, as we discuss um, our um, strategic vision, we should probably include this within that, along with our discussions of multi-year play plans and other things along those lines. These are good things for us to discuss as a board, and I think, frankly, it's probably understood as the majority of the boards want, but it is not so much documented for us as a board as what we want. And so my encouragement is, is to continue to have this good data and good talking points, and let's put it in a way that we can actually make it more actionable and uh, try to deliver upon it. I think it's wanted. But to my colleague, uh, Ms. Player's point, um, yeah, the money is uh, in addition to, I'm so sorry. Oh. And, because uh, that was crushing oh, to us. Let's do it now. Uh, we had a similar moment in 2018. In 2018, we had a similar moment. So I knew it was coming. I thought, oh no, she's running into it like, like I did. Acting. I apologize. Um, and so it is really crushing, but it is a priority. And to your point, our, I want to make sure that our staff know that they are important to us. For example, in South Nashville, we just had recently a couple roofs pulled off of some buildings. And in one of my schools, the people that let us know about that damage were the custodian staff. And it was because they had been there for so long and they were a part of that family. They were there, let us know in advance, let us get kind of an early move on it and cleaned it up before any of the teachers even got there. That's well above and beyond what our current contract asks of them. And that's because of the relationships they have with us. And to your point, Ms. Tyler, that is likely because of us, not because of their current employer. That's because of who we are. So I love that, but I do want them to be a part of our team again. And so I want us to make sure that we we acknowledge it in a more formal way so that we can make some more progress towards it. And it's not just an ongoing conversation, but an actionable movement that we could possibly have as much as we can. And then I think Frida's next. Yep. Frida Player Peters. And I'm hoping. Yeah, so back to the cost. <laughs> so the reason it's not that easy, cause, because for a company to make money when they outsource, there's there's lesser benefits mm -hmm. and lesser pay. So when at the time in 2010 when we did it, the you know you had a lead custodian that roughly made $17 an hour. You had one that makes $15 an hour. When the new contract came in under a different contractor, uh, 
they went down to about 15 if you're a lead, went down to 11. Then several years later, they went down to minimum wage. Um, and because they had the right to do that, and we could not control what they did as a hiring practice. So it went back down. That was literally 12 years ago. So now that we have to go back to the living wage of right now, so the pay now, and then remember, we just redid our support staff pay scale. So now you have to add in that new cost of living on top of that. On top of that, we have a pension. On top of that, we have a robust healthcare system. And so the way the outsourcing we make money is lowering the, having a high deductible, high, um, high deductible insurance and cost, and also they have a 401k, not a defined benefit plan. And so that's another cost that we have to add into it. So when we look at the cost, it's not just the life of the contract, it's how they make their money and their profit <coughs> is by offering lesser quality benefits than we do as a government source, which, because we're self-insured and blah, 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 that's a whole nother ball wax that we have to go into. So that's what the cost is much different. And then our standard and our moral values of how we want to play our support staff on top of the current pay scale makes it much more expensive. So it's not simply of, oh, we just take a contract, we absorb it, and we do that. Then we're bringing our, those current employees to our employee and contract standard. Plus, supplies cost different than it did in 2010. Equipment costs different in 2010. We're talking about sustainability crowd that came in here. If we want to use green products, those are more expensive. So it goes into, it's not just a simple, hey, this is the contract, this is the cost, and this is what we're going to do. The equipment. And also, guys, we're in the middle of inflation, so everything costs more. And then we have shipping costs. Like, so it's a on and on thing that I did not want to belabor the point, but if it was that simple, trust me, I would have done it like three years ago when I first came on the board. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> All right. Comment. All right, Mrs. Uh, Bush. So I hear you, Frida, but if we're not getting the quality of service, it doesn't matter. If our schools are not getting the services and not, if the schools are not clean, then I get it, what you're trying to say. But we want the cost to equal quality service. We want the cost to be able to support our children, especially our girls, because our girls need so much support in those bathrooms. And I have been called over and over again how nasty the bathrooms are. So my point of it is, that's great. But if they're delivering the services, that's what I always think about. That's what we always have to think about, because we pay for something, we want to get what we pay for, right? So that's my whole point. I get what you're saying, but the quality and the, um, and, and the <laughs> services, that's what we're working on. If they want $100 million, and they do the best service that they do, and I mean when things are just shining and sparkling, then hey, they deserve it. If they're paying their employees like they should, then we wouldn't have the shortages and wouldn't have these issues. So I get it about the contract, I get it about the money, but we need to make sure that the quality of service is delivered. That's what we want to do. So I get it. I promise I get it. I just want to make sure that the world out there understands that. David Prophet understands that, because I think he does, because he always answers to those demands when we have those issues in the schools. But my point of it is, is that we want to make sure that the quality of service is delivered. That's my point. Great. All right, we'll move on for the question. Uh, do we have a motion on the floor? Uh, call a question. Go right ahead. Can you restate the motion? I never made a motion. Oh. I, just, I just pulled it off for discussion. All right, would you mind making a motion? Somebody's welcome to. I move that we move the contract. I second. All right, all in favor? Please raise your hand. Oh, I have to <laughs> All right, so it passes unanimously. All right. Thank you. Uh, was that for both one and seven? Yep. All right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> sure. All right. So we have moved and accepted uh, contracts for 1B1 and 1B7. We will now move on to an to announcements. Um, we'll start on this end with Mrs. Pupo Walker. Okay. I want to congratulate my friend Frida Player for being selected for this year's <laughs> Leadership Nashville class. Yay. Woo! Represent us well over there. I love it. I, I want to give a, a quick shout out to our sustainability speakers tonight. I thought that was inspiring. I'm, was. I'm all in. I think that's wonderful. Um, I want to thank uh, Ms. Masters for all her hard work on selecting a new student board member. I guess we're not announcing that just now. Oh, I'm going to announce it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And don't you do I'm it. I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to say I'm excited. Um, and I just want to say congrats to uh, the remainder of our new principals. I'm excited about all these new principals that we hired and, you know, 
elevating our own. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Bush. Yeah, I just want to uh, just say uh, congratulations again to all of our um, student athletes. It's been really exciting to see all of their hard work and all their medals that they have received and so happy that they were able to uh, get back on those fields, play their sports, and uh, make sure we can, you know, we that they've made us proud and they've made themselves proud. So I'm really excited about that. And um, you guys just have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Little. All right. I don't know who have done it, but I really want to honor Sister Sandra Smithson. Um, I actually got my start in education of just meeting with her in grad school with, with Jenny Bertini and, and Turner. And she was there because she kept driving, even though she was in her 80s. Um, they had to take her license away. And I want to say two or three weeks ago, I found out that she passed. And Hold on. I'm sorry. What? Yeah. Yeah, and I'll say four weeks ago, I was in her, in Bellevue, um, in her, nun, I guess it's the nun retirement home, um, is what I call it. <laughs> but, she was, <laughs> yep. but she was still talking about literacy and reading, and I had to run, and she said, hey, even though she had her mask on, she was like, do you do you hug? And I was like, for, uh, you know, 90, 90 year plus nun, like, definitely, and I gave her a <laughs> hug, and just, I, I hate that she She's gone, but I, I just, she has a lasting impression on education here in Nashville. Yeah, thank you. Of course, I'm, um, I, I will go and then we'll move down and come back to you. I apologize. Um, so for my announcements, um, I first want to say that something I really loved tonight uh, during the awards and recognition was, I mean, besides all the clinging of the medals, was uh, how much all the students supported each other. Uh, they cheered for each other and made sure that they were each seen in the photos. And um, that collaboration and goodness of our kids is just really wonderful to see in person. And I just wanted to make sure that y'all all knew that we saw it and that if you didn't see it, it was there. Um, on that note, uh, Overton's Teacher of the Year this year, uh, Meredith McGinnis, has been chosen as a Fulbright Scholar, and she's going to Greece to study how high schools prepare students for post-secondary opportunities. Um, she's a social studies teacher at Overton, but she also has the responsibilities to help our students um, with their post-secondary opportunities. Um, I know she's going to flourish there. She, of course, as I mentioned, she's the Teacher of the Year at Overton. Um, but I also really appreciate that Overton has allowed her to have that flexibility to attend and be a part of the Fulbright program. It will benefit not only her as our employee, but it will also benefit our students. And um, just on a, a personal note, Meredith and I went to the same high school, though she, she is younger than me. Um, <laughs> we did go to the same high school, so go CHS. And um, lastly, I am, um, no, I'm going to, I'll move on. Never mind. Thank you. Um, first, I want to get clarification about what I said about test scores. That there's a vast improvement from to, to pre pandemic We're not at baseline, so I know that was repeated. But I want to clarify that we've made gains, but um, that we're still working from a place. So I want to clarify that that um, before from the from the state website that the state has made a significant gains to pre pandemic levels. Um, and then also shout out to the track people, especially the throwers, as a form of shot put and discus thrower. It's cool to see us doing that because the runners get all the glory you know and people forget about us field people sometimes so yeah well I did both too but I hated running the 400 <laughs> sucks but anyway. um, and the other one happy pride month why we're here to all the employees and students um, who are part of the community as you know last year um, we used past resolution thanks to our colleague Mrs. Masters and that we continue to support you and hopefully you have a warm and welcoming environment um, as you have your education um, so I, um, I have very exciting news. <laughs> um, I'm going to start by uh, saying that we have a new student member of the board who, yay, um, who will be um, sworn in and will begin in September. When right, that's, that's the first the first meeting in September. Um, after a, a lengthy process, applicants from 11 different high schools, which was I think very exciting. Um, eight finalists who had interviews. Um, 
we narrowed it down to five that we met with here in person um, on Friday, and Ebenezer Hale and Angelique Quimbo both um, talked with them via Zoom. Um, and after all of that, I can't do a drum roll. Um, <laughs> um, I am proud to announce that Elena Mitchell, who is a rising junior at Hillsborough High School, is going to be our new student member of the board. And there, yay, Elena. There will be a press release on the MPS website tomorrow with a whole lot more information about Elena. But since Ebenezer wasn't able to be here tonight, I am actually going to read what he had to say about this choice since he will be working so closely with her. I would just love to say that I'm extremely happy with the selection made and I feel like a lot of effort and thought was put into the whole process. Thank you, Ebenezer. I appreciate that. <laughs> I think the purpose of this selection is to continue the extremely important work Anjali has done while also making sure the person selected brings in their own new perspectives. I feel like Elena Mitchell has a wonderful view on how we can improve our community and our district and I'm extremely excited to start working with her. I also want to thank every single person that applied for the position and the sheer amount of people that applied exemplifies just how interested students are in their district and how this position is helping move the student body in the correct way. As usual, the student board member <laughs> put it better than I ever could. Um, I am really excited to work with her. I'm also, I have to say, really excited about some of the students we were able to connect with through this process, and I'm planning to hang on to them. Some of, some of them have already been referred to the advocacy group NOAA to ask questions um, during the upcoming school board candidate forums. So um, just a lot of exciting things going on with students in the district. Um, I also wanted to congratulate Congratulate Renita Perry on being appointed our new Chief of Innovation. Is Renita here? Yay! Hi! So I have to tell y'all that I am I am the squeaky wheel um, for, for better or for worse um, when I feel I need to be. But after going through um, a process that involved um, Renita Perry with one of my district schools and some state mandated um, re review process and working with a consultant, I texted Dr. Battle and was like, this Renita Perry, she has it going on. Like, I'm feeling this. It was great. Just such an advocate for our district um, and for for the teachers and students in that school specifically. And maybe maybe a little bit scary maybe to the consultants sometimes, which I really like. So <laughs> I just, you are a fierce advocate for MMPS. I'm so excited to see what you do in this position. I just thank you so much. I'm very excited about this appointment. So. Um, I'm just going to end on that high note right now. Um, I also want to um, thank our sustainability crew who showed up. I wore green in solidarity with them for their sustainability efforts. Um, two of the schools that they talked about who did food waste um, audits were in my district. And I have just been so proud of the efforts that I've seen from more than just one person, but, but the way the community has rallied around helping the schools do the work to be sustainable. And it's cost Metro zero dollars. And it has cost them, in, I mean, the time has been volunteer time and it has been, they've brought in money to MNPS because they've gotten people to give grants. Um, they've gotten pollinator gardens put in in different schools. They've gotten um, people to come in. I mean, she, you heard that uh, Miss Miss McIntyre talked about having a refrigerator donated for the for the food waste redistribution. Um, so, not only are they being sustainable, but they're also not costing Metro anything and bringing in money to us. So, I just want to applaud them for their efforts. Let them know that I am supportive of everything they're doing, and. Um, that I want to continue to see more schools. It's already happening in pockets all over MMPS. Um, and I just really would love to see it happening in every school that we have this kind of, this is just part of who we are as Metro. Um, and this is just the way we educate our students. So thank you guys for coming out.
out. We invite you back whenever you want to come. Um, I invite you back whenever you want to come. <laughs> and then also, I wanted to just take a moment and say, as we continue to move forward through budget season, I want to um, reiterate to both our staff and the council members who may or may not be listening, that our top priority has been employee compensation this whole time. From day one, when we started our budget, employee compensation is the number one priority and with an emphasis on our support staff this year. Um, so as council continues their discussions about the budgets, I want them to know that based on our own priorities, that any money that goes beyond what we have already approved, we're going to be putting that towards our support staff because that is what we have identified as where we want to make sure we're making the biggest difference. And we, we've identified that that is where we want to put that money. So um, I will continue to advocate for that as we move forward. I will continue to advocate for that with council members. I invite you from the public, um, other board members, to also advocate for for um, enough money to pay our, our uh, support staff a living wage. And um, I just want to thank them for the work they've done this year because I know I called out um, and, and was supportive of teachers and the work they did earlier, but again, they couldn't have done it without the support staff either. It is a big web of support that, that everybody needs everybody else. So thank everybody for what you've done this year. All right. Um, Yes, go right ahead, Mrs. Elrod. I meant to uh, also mention that on the note of pride, Lish. MMPS is involved inside the Pride event for Nashville. The Pride Parade is uh, Saturday, June 25th, and the parade lineup begins at 9 o'clock. Uh, last year, it was uh, myself and uh, my colleague, Mr. Little, which I really appreciate his uh, presence. Um, it's a really great time. We have nifty flags and uh, good good shirts and a, and a banner. <laughs> and um, it's only a mile. And so we really hope that y'all can come. Um, if you, as colleagues, if you would like to attend, you got an email from Dr. Cusson Lark that was forwarded by Dr. Severe on the 23rd. Um, and of course, if you, as um, uh, somebody else within MMPS would like to participate, whether you're as a student or not, please email me and I'll figure out how to get that done for you. But um, we have a limit of 300 participants and I would, I would love it if we got close to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on a somber note, Mr. Little, thank you for raising that about Sister Sandra. I had no idea. I don't know where I've been, but I became a teacher because Sister Sandra hired me at Simpson Craighead in 2009. Um, I was still working on my um, teacher licensure and I, I I appreciated that one of our last conversations, she talked about how she was so excited to see Nashville grow in different ways, and she just hopes that the disenfranchised come with it. Baby, I, I, the, the memory that I will hold on to that I hope will make you all smile is that she was definitely a fierce advocate, and she would try to convince you of whatever she had in mind, and it was always with the best interest of students in mind, even if we didn't agree, but she was not going back down and she was not gonna stop calling. I should have known I hadn't gotten my monthly call that something was amiss, but we send our prayers to her family. I know um, she has some family still in the city, um, but you know what, we'll go out like this. We will continue to work hard because MMPS educators past and present are impacting MMPS students past and present. So be there no further business. Uh, congratulations MMPS for all you've done and all you will do. Thank you for Dr. Battle for just being you. This meeting is adjourned. What's that? No. Nah, uh... This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.